evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Board of Selectmen meeting for today, May 16, 2017. As per form, let's start with the Pledge of Allegiance led by the Girl Scouts of, uh, what troop are you guys? 65294. 65294. Girls, please, come on up. <coughs> Don't be shy. And on your mark, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Excellent job, girls. <laughs> okay, also per, as performed, we're going to... Um, Start with the uh, public session, public forum. Residents are invited to share ideas, opinions, or ask questions regarding town government. Is there anyone that would like to come forward? Okay, we'll be in our studio audience. All right, then let's move right on to our consent agenda. That was, we'll be right up there on time. <coughs> As part of the Bronze Award, the Girl Scout Troop 65294 will present the Board of Selectmen the final design for the traffic signs for the distracted driving campaign. They have met with the DPW, the Hopkinton Police, to finalize the design that is informative and not distracting itself. Girls, come on up and join us. I thought you were giving us new shoes. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. If you take a box, <coughs> yes, I would. Thanks. My name is Olivia Wade. As a follow-up to our previous presentation to Thank the you. Board of Selectmen, we wanted to get your final approval for the design of the traffic sign related to distracted <coughs> driving. We have met with the DPW and Hopkinton Police Department to review design options. This design has been approved by both the DPW and the Hopkinton Police, Chief Lee and Lieutenant Bennett. They suggest we get final approval from the Board of Selectmen before having the signs produced. In addition, the list of locations where the signs will be installed in town is being provided to you as well. The plan is to have the signs produced and installed by the end of June. The DPW and Hopkinton Police will assist our troop in the installation of the signs. Thank you for your time and support on this very important <coughs> issue. Wonderful girls, wonderful. Excellent. Thank you very much. This is a, it's, this is a great community service. Let's, uh, let's ask for the board for some, some input. Um, so. uh, yeah, I think this is great. <coughs> you guys came to us before with a preliminary plan and you guys worked very quickly to get this implemented. You did a great job. You said you worked with the police department on this, Chief Lee and Lieutenant Bennett. Did you find them easy to work with? <laughs> they didn't bring cookies. They didn't bring cookies? <laughs> I did. So I, um, I think you guys did a wonderful job. And any time that the, the kids in the town can take a, an initiative on something like this, which is very big, uh, don't think that it's not a big, it's a big issue. You guys did a great job. And I know it's a little nerve wracking to get up there and present in front of all of us. You did a wonderful job. Congratulations and thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wright. So, this is a great project and uh, your presentation actually answered a number of my questions about how many and where. Um, how big are the signs going to be? Can you kind of show me with your hands? Is it like a billboard or is it like a little tiny um, thing? I, <laughs> yeah, about that tall. Um, yeah, how wide? <laughs> so like um, <laughs> um, They're going to be big enough so we don't have to be distracted to look at them, right, when we're driving? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, no, that's part of the question. I mean, you know, <coughs> we're really careful with the signage not to make it, you know, signage can be good and it can be ugly, too, if there's too much signage. So you don't want something that's going to be, you know, too enormous, but obviously you need to be able to see it. So it's sounding like what you're saying is that you like the sign that the speed limit signs are kind of rectangular. Probably a little uh, smaller. A little smaller, and smaller. And it looks like you are putting in, uh, well, it says not more than 12, but right now you've got plans for 
looks like ten. Um, where'd you get the money? Um, Your allowance? Um, well, we were working with the DPW. Uh huh. Uh -huh. They yeah. are um, paying for the sign. Excellent. So Excellent. you guys are going to do, you did all the work to design it and get all the approvals, and, and they'll help you with the funding. And um, will you be out there digging the holes, or will Mr. Westerling do that? Um, uh, um, he will. <laughs> he will? <laughs> We will be there too. You will yeah. be there too. Well, I think it's a great project and uh, it sounds like they're just the right size and I give you a ton of credit for coming up with this. And I want to say one more thing. I'm really pleased to see that you're putting at the exits because you talked about it not being distracting in itself. And I thought, you know, if you're driving down the road and you're seeing this, but you're right. You thought that through. The exits is where you got people that are still talking on their phones or, or whatever. So that um, it just seems like it's been really well thought out. Thank you. Great. Excellent. This is story. This is a great job. And it's great that you girls and, and I know other girls in your troop and your parents obviously care about the community and you're trying to do something to help make things better as we roll forward. Um, these signs are, what are they made of? Are they going to be something that's kind of permanent or are they going to be something like um, like all those political signs that people are taking down today, um, they, what are they going to be like? Um, they are permanent signs. They're permanent? That's great. So this will be a constant reminder. Um, it also might help me with my diet so I don't eat cheeseburgers. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so that'll be good. <laughs> But um, this is a great idea. Can you tell me a little bit? Now, this is this is to help you both get uh, get to a certain level in Girl Scouts, right? And get an award. Yeah. Can you tell us about that a little bit? Um, to well, it's the bronze award is the highest um, like achieve honor that a Girl Scout can re a junior can receive, and you have to. Um, on your bronze award, you have to work 20 hours, and yeah, um, not really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good, and it has to be something that's community related, I would imagine, something that's going to help some other people. Um, right? Yeah, it's going to help the community. That's great. That's great. Well, I think you've achieved that. So, um, thank you, and I hope that this isn't the last thing you do to help the community, right? Um, no. You keep yeah. on going, right? Great. Well, this is a good job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, girls, for, for stepping up and, and doing some community service. I can't wait to see what you guys are going to do for gold awards. Because that's what you, that's what we have come up here. And this is a great bronze award. This is something that I could see somebody actually doing as a, as a gold award if you were older. Um, this is, this, a lot, you guys really did put, you probably put more than the 20 hours into this project because yeah. I saw all the, you were going around canvassing neighborhoods and asking questions. <laughs> And little symposiums going, designing everything. So that, that's a great job. Really, we're very, very proud of you. Thank you very much for coming up. You know, I just yeah. think this is great because years ago they used to have signs that say "Buckle up," because when when we first started using seatbelts before it, be, it became the norm to put seatbelts on, we had, had to remind people to wear seatbelts. And they used to have these whenever you'd leave a, 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 a um, any kind of a venue, they would say, remind people to buckle up. So this is a great thing to tell people to get off their phone and, and uh, or, or stop eating and, and actually pay attention when they're pulling out in, into, into one of our neighborhoods. So thank you very much. Thank you to the whole troop. And uh, thanks for coming forward. Thank you. Congratulations. Um, yes. And if you haven't already done so, um, you can sign the pledge if you want to. <laughs> Absolutely, we we'll all love to sign the pledge. Thank you. Uh, um, so come on, look. Is, there, is there a is there a motion that we have to do do for this? With, with your permission. Um, but first off, let me also uh, I thank the uh, the girls for doing a fabulous job. Uh, as was expressed earlier, getting the police chief and the DPW director to all agree. Uh, with your project is never easy. Uh, so thank you for doing this public safety uh, project. Thank you. Uh, the motion kindly would be for the Board of Selectmen to approve the Don't Drive Distracted Signs as presented tonight. So moved. Second. Excellent. Any further discussion? Hearing that, how do you vote? Aye. 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 Opposed? 
we abstain? Excellent, and unanimous. Thank you very much. Okay, girls, we'd love to sign that. I jumped right ahead. I'll take a sentence. Since we're only two items, I'll take a sentence. I jumped to the sign. Oh, All good. For Mr. Her, so he can sign later too. He's probably driving kind of fast right now. So we keep these. You'll be able to keep an eye on everyone in your neighborhood. So we keep these and we give them back to you. No, we give them back. Okay. Can you give us a treat bag? Awesome. Right. Right. Thank you. Are these girl show cookies? This under fifty dollars, Mr. Kamala. That's good. Doesn't matter. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We very nice of you guys. Right. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. This is the very well organized girls. Very okay. well organized. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, parents. Thank you. And thank, thank you, Mr. Westling, Chief Lee, Lieutenant. Thanks awesome. so much. Thank you. Round of applause for girls. Girls. Thank you. Thank you. Girls, one, let's do a quick, we're, 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 we're on time. Let's do a quick picture with photo girls. Photo up? Yeah. 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 All right. yeah. Exodus. <laughs> <laughs> there goes half our crowd. <laughs> we, we have a quorum? <laughs> One percent. Okay. Um, ambulance fund gifts. Board Sun will consider accepting several ambulance funds gift in the memory of firefighter Tom McIntyre. Would you take this one? Mr. I would. Well, as I said the last meeting, um, it's a great testament to see the donations from the people when you when I read the list of who's donated, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a lot of the who's who between this meeting and the last meeting. Uh, who's who from Hopkinton and, and uh, people who he's, who he's obviously touched uh, pretty deeply. And uh, it's, a, it's a great list of people and it just shows, uh, I mean, I know the, the majority of people on this list and um, <coughs> it's, a, it's a, just a great testament of what Mac meant to the town. And honestly, I expect to see this uh, probably on the next four or five meetings. You know, people are just getting around to, to doing it, but uh, it's just, the guy was the best, and uh, this is a good showing of, of people that, uh, that will agree and feel the same way. So uh, I know that the family thinks very highly of, of everything that's going on, and, and um, his direct family is very appreciative of everything that happened from uh, you know, from the support that the town showed to the uh, all the the pomp and circumstance with his funeral and wake, and um, you know they're just they're very 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 um, overwhelmed with, with how the town came together for him, which is um, you know not not uh, it's it's not surprising if you know how the family is where they're very you know unassuming and and uh, you know Tommy used to say that. Uh, besides his, fa his famous line of it's better to ac ask for forgiveness than permission, uh, he would always say, ah, it's no big deal. And um, it's, a, it's just an absolute great thing. And <clears throat> I hate to go on and on and on about him, but I will go on and on and on about him every meeting. Um, 
you know, one of the one of the things. It's a it's a funny quote that um, when we were doing the lights at the Little League field, it was a Sunday. He said, "Why don't you meet me down the garage?" Uh, this he called me on Saturday. Meet me at the garage at six o'clock Sunday morning. I said, "All right, what are we doing?" He said, "Doesn't matter. Just show up." So I showed up. He's like, "Take the truck with the low bed and the excavator up to Carrigan Park." And I said, "Well, I don't really even have a license for this." He goes, "You don't need a license. It's Sunday." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I believed him. Yeah. And uh, but I'm getting off course, and, and I could go off. I could go all night on him. But from the from the bottom of my heart, as a selectman, as and as a friend of his. Thank you very much for everyone that's donated to the Ambulance Fund. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. I just want to mention one thing. Uh, in addition to what Mr. Tedstone said, he mentioned that this list and the week before, the one before uh, last meeting was a who's who of Hopkinton, which it is. But for those watching at home who haven't seen the list, uh, it's not just Hopkinton people on that list. There are people from other communities as well. And uh, I think that's, you know, a testament to Tom McIntyre and the, he touched a lot of people in a larger community. And uh, yeah, he was Mr. Hopkinton, but uh, um, those donations have just come in from, from all over the place and that really says a lot, so. Yep. Uh, what is this, 14 donations uh, with $1,535 just in 14 donations. And yeah, it's a total, I, I quickly totaled it up just roughly, and it's around $3,000 in the last Between two Between the weeks. two. Yeah. yeah. So it definitely <coughs> goes to, to good use. Anything else to say? No, I mean, you know, the, uh, I love, I love uh, talking with Mr. Tedstone about this. Um, I'm one of the people who is lucky enough to be, uh, uh, to, to benefit from a lot of the efforts of Mr. McIntyre, uh, but I was unlucky in the sense that um, I, I never knew him well enough to, to say he was a friend. Uh, you know, I certainly have heard all of the stories about the things he's done, uh, and I envy the people who, who were close to him and got to spend a lot of time with him, so. Yeah, very lucky. Um, but yeah, he sounds like a special person. Excellent. So on that note, the chair will maintain a motion to accept the uh, ambulance fund gifts for uh, this week in the memory of firefighter Tom McIntyre. So moved. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Okay, let's jump on to the real agenda. Let's see, we're going to jump right into uh, the taser policies. Uh, Mr. Kamalo, uh, could you... Uh, uh, please uh, help us introduce the uh, chief and what's coming up. I, yes, thank you. Okay. Yes, uh, through the chair. Uh, on April 25th, the chief and his team uh, presented the laser, uh, the taser uh, policies to the board, or proposal rather. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the board authorized the chief to continue his investigation of the proposed deployment of tasers in town. And during that presentation, the chief specifically pointed out that as part of deploying the tasers, the town is required to identify, put forth specific policies. Uh, and per the town charter, these policies will need to be approved by the town board. And here tonight, uh, the chief will be presenting three specific policies in regard to deploying tasers. <coughs> Welcome, chief. It's good to be here. Come. Thanks for bringing this to us. Yeah, because we, we did talk about this a few weeks ago, and we told you to uh, come back to us with uh, some things we can look at for the policies and see if that uh, if it meets the uh, the uh, approval of everyone. What do you got for us? Well. Uh, uh, as you are aware, we are going through the accreditation policy. So uh, we have a lot of policies in place. We're updating a lot of policies. One policy that we've always had for quite some time, and most agencies do, is a use of force policy. So basically, the one that we submitted in the package was a uh, policy that's uh, been approved in the past and uh, has been updated uh, a bit. Uh, second one was the uh, use of force uh, reporting policy, and uh, that, that is a newer one specific to uh, us reporting. Not only do we report use of force um, within the department, we also report it, report it to the state. Um, and finally, the uh, third policy, the new uh, 
less than lethal uh, taser device. I don't know if you all had a chance to look at it. It's a rather lengthy policy. Uh, we had a PowerPoint presentation, which we went over uh, uh, the specifics of the policy. Uh, I will let you know that uh, on uh, April uh, 21st, I received a, um, a letter from uh, Secretary of Public Safety and Security, uh, Dan Bennett, approving our policy and also reminding us that we, we will report uh, the use of not only the use of force, any type of use of force, but a separate form specific to the tasers on a semi uh, annual basis. Um, if you'd like to get in a little more detail on the policies, I'm here to introduce uh, Lieutenant Porter. I'd just like to uh, take the time and just uh, say what a you know, unbelievable job he's been doing since he's been promoted, and he's really put a lot of time and effort into the policies and procedures. And uh, we're working well with a uh, committee within the police department, uh, members of uh, mass cops, uh, dispatchers, and uh, we go through uh, every policy uh, and um, ensure that we're all on the same page and they're going to be tailor-made for the, the Hopkinton Police Department. But as far as the, uh, the taser policy, um, it, it's, it's standard throughout the state. And um, we have to follow all the all their regulations. Otherwise, we would get the okay from EOPS. But now we're presenting it uh, here tonight, so we could uh, get the final approval and then uh, move in direction and get this uh, device that you know we hope will reduce injuries to suspects, reduce injuries uh, uh, to police officers, and uh, perhaps save lives. Any questions? Okay. Well, uh, I've been a, a proponent of this since I got on. I think it's overdue. And, um, you know, I read through the policies quickly. You know, I, I'm, uh, I'm not a cop, but I play one on the weekends. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's who am I to second guess the, the state mandated policies and, and, and then for you guys to look at them and kind of adapt them if there are needs to adapt them to Hopkins in specific. Uh, I think it's great and uh, I like how aggressive you are getting this back to us. So the quicker we can put another tool in your toolbox to kind of save lives uh, and to stop some crime, and uh, I think uh, the quicker the better. So good job, well done, and thank you very much. One, one other point I just uh, sure. should also add is the, uh, the amount of training that will go in there. We just uh, decided uh, two, two officers um, Alex Cruz Vergara, who came from our Virginian Police Department. He is uh, already a taser instructor. He'll have to do a follow-up in mass. And we also look at to uh, Peter Hotnez. Boy, a couple of names that are tough to pronounce, huh? <laughs> 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 and he'll be uh, assisting him in being the assistant uh, instructor. We think they'll both do a, a great job, but there's a, a lot of training. Everyone has to get certified. And, and uh, Lieutenant Bennett, and uh, Lieutenant Porter and uh, Sergeant Van Rolton will be assuring that uh, that it, everything is done uh, proper. So just a follow-up question on that. Mm -hmm. um, when my brother went through it, he had to get tased, as I have previously mentioned, and it was, brings a smile to my face. <laughs> is is that terrible. policy still in place? And if it is still in place, will there be a spot for the selectmen to sit and watch the training? <laughs> oh my God! No, no, no. <laughs> okay. Well, participate if we like, but okay. we could have a fundraiser. <laughs> I, I, I kind of like a dunk tank, tank, right? I think we're moving on from Mr. Ted Stone. Ms. But, Wright, <laughs> please save us. Uh, yes, I, I just want to ask. We have these uh, various policies that were given to us in the packet last time. Um, so, am I correct from what you said, Chief Lee, that most of these policies um, use based standardized state policies as as a template? So we have that sort of degree of protection that this is a uh, uniform statewide tried and tested. Hopefully, will stand up legally set of set of policies oh. we're not reinventing the wheel here absolutely and the uh, the other thing to, to note too is uh, the, the product that we're going to uh, hopefully purchase is the only certified product uh, mm -hmm. th through uh, the state of Massachusetts the only approved th uh, through through the policy and um, a lot of the standards that come in the policy they're also federal CALEA standards as well 
And so this is not only a state policy, but mm -hmm. it's pretty much the norm throughout the country. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, one more question through you, Mr. Chair. I know, Chief, Chief, you said something about tailor-made, and I wasn't sure if you meant that um, just this type of a lower level, less lethal policy is tailor-made for presumably the kind of community we are, or do you mean that have there been some tailorings to the policies that to, to, to suit them to Hopkinton, or are these, the, what we're using is going to be standardized? Standardized, what, and I was referring to the whole accreditation <coughs> mm. process in a whole, and a lot of times you have to tailor, uh, make little uh, nuances of a teaser to fit specific needs for oh. the Hopkinton Police Department. Okay. But there's nothing different. And the only thing that was different is we increased the amount of hours each officer will be trained on it from okay. the state standards. The state okay. standards was here, and we raised the standards. That was our choice. Excellent. Thank you. Sorry. Um, generally, I don't have any questions on this, especially if we're going with the state standards. Um, you know, really un unchanged. There is one section here about uh, when the officer should not deploy an ECW, and it gives different scenarios. Mm -hmm. Pregnant women, people with cardiac disease, or weak hearts. I'm just wondering, I didn't see anything in here if, um, if the person says, don't tase me, bro. Uh, are they covered? <laughs> no. They're not covered? Not the <laughs> okay. <laughs> This, this, if they this, conform this and say don't tase me, bro, then they won't be tased. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, I think that I think that um, like Mr. Ted oh, Stone my. said, uh, I think that this is great that we're that we're bringing this into Hopkinton. Um, you know, something something that gives you uh, another level, I guess, of, of support, another tool in the toolbox, as everyone said. Um, that but that's non-lethal. So, I mean, obviously, you know, we're. We're hoping to continue calling ourselves a sleepy little town, and um, you know, hoping that we don't get into situations mm -hmm. where where we need the lethal force. But at the same time, there may be times where you guys need protection, or you need to protect others in the public. So, uh, this is a great idea, and uh, glad you're acting so quickly on it. Appreciate it. Thank you. And appreciate your efforts too. Thank you, sir. Uh, great. Uh, actually, geez, all my answers, all my uh, questions were answered. Certified units, training, and state standard. It's, that's that's great. The only other one is uh, um, in the reporting procedures. Uh, uh, is uh, are there? Um, you know, I know when when a uh, a weapon is discharged, that there's a there's a a lot of reporting necessary. Is that is that similar in this in this case? Is this considered as um, as lethal to some extent? Well, the uh, it would certainly be a. Uh, a difference uh, deploying a uh, serv service weapon, uh, deploying lethal weapon, uh, there would be other agencies that came from the outside uh, to investigate. That would not be the same unless there was a, happened to be an incident where a, a, a taser for some uh, reason became a, a lethal weapon, and then it would certainly be uh, investigated by outside agencies. Excellent. Thank you. Do you have anything else? Anything for us? For, uh, you know, um, no. Are we just forgetting a, anything? No. Yeah. I, I just appreciate the uh, the support. There's a, a lot of uh, excitement down at the uh, department. The men and women there are extremely uh, happy to have another tool on their belt that uh, will make them feel a little safer on the streets. One more question um, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I support anything that is going to protect our police force that puts their lives on the lines every day and anything that's going to make it easier and I use that word easier I mean easier your job is never easy but um, safer for you to do your job um, it, it seems to nowadays that in cases where there has been deadly force used um, I mean, I suppose there are instances we don't hear about, but we just seem to be in such an atmosphere now where every time there's deadly force that needs to be used, there's instantly a, a lawsuit, a challenge, charges filed. Um, you know, the police are really constantly on the defensive. The tasers are a fairly new tool, and I don't know what kind of statistics there are, but they're being used more and more. Do you know if... Um, the uh, statistics of their use show um, that, by and large, their use results in 
not or fewer or few challenges does the, you know what I'm saying is, is mm -hmm. the use more widely accepted and less likely to produce um, charges than, than what we've been seeing in, in the more lethal means. Well, well our accepted. offices are doing an incredible amount of uh, training dealing with uh, me mental illness and yeah. things of that nature. And you'll certainly have incidents where you're looking for a diversion program. Be that as it may, instead of sending someone to jail, you might encounter a situation where someone has threatened themselves with a weapon right. or a knife where they wouldn't necessarily uh, be arrested, but without the taser, it could turn into a violent struggle. Yeah. And you've certainly seen a decline in those type of incidents as well. When, you, when, when it comes to a lethal situation, <laughs> your, your training brings you right to a, a, a lethal response. So a taser, yeah. you wouldn't take the place of uh, someone threatening your life with a weapon with a taser, but yeah. there's certainly other, many different other scenarios that could escalate <laughs> to a lethal situation that you could take it out before it got to that point. Yeah. No, no, I, I, I understand and I understand completely why you're using I was just wondering what, what reporting data there is now on um, incidences where police forces have used the taser, have many of those resulted in any kind of charges filed or whatever, or does it seem to be a more accepted, less, uh, uh, action that is less prone to um, bringing lawsuits, charges, oh, uh, filings. Yeah. I mean, it, it, without that option uh, in the past, with, with tases, uh, you know, especially in yeah. uh, you know, the communities where, where I've worked, um, you know, you have a, in a situation that if it turns into a violent encounter that yeah. you can't stop quickly. It will turn into, you know, possible assault charges against police officer, things of that nature, resisting uh -huh. arrest. And uh, so th this certainly been a, a decrease in, in uh, injuries against officers. Uh, the, that's been a pattern yeah. for, for, a, for a long time now. And, in and injuries with a suspect. Where it's being used, it's generally yes. been accepted it, it, in the community. It's and usually we, well received. But there's injuries with suspects, that is a potential lawsuit right. nine out of 10 times. <laughs> right, right. Okay, Sorry. thank you. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion. Sure, Mr. Chair. Uh, I move that the board vote to approve the police department policies relative the, to the deployment of tasers with the understanding that these policies uh, reflect the guidelines put forth by the state for use of tasers uh, with the exception of the training hours. And I guess I'd further uh, like to have the town uh, adopt any changes that the state puts, puts forward uh, to their policies as well. So Mr. Camargo, is that uh, could be good enough? Yes, and, and through the chair, if I may, um, quick question for the chief. Did, did Ray review the policies? Did town council review the policies? I believe he did, yes. Okay, so then so if we can add that, yes. but, if so, but if we could add that just to make sure, okay. yes. yes. Mr. Mm -hmm. Mr. Stein, yeah. if we can add that to, to, the, motion up. to the motion to have uh, town council review them to make sure that, that everything is, uh, is up to in, in order. Okay. Uh, uh, just a like a friendly amendment um, to your motion where you said that it adheres we need to a, this. We need a second before oh, we can yes. I'll amend. second it. Okay. Now, you can. now your friendly amendment, real friendly, um, <laughs> where you said that it'll meet the state guidelines. I think we should probably put in there state guidelines or department departmental guidelines, whichever are more stringent. Yeah, I think, I, yeah. I, 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 I thought I was saying minimally, but yeah. yeah, that's definitely the intent. Yeah. Okay, so we have a motion. Any further discussion? Is there right? so a vote on the amendment? I will withdraw. 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 I will Okay, our window will go behind. Okay, so now that the next ma next uh, item on the agenda is the Lake Maspinock Weed Advisory Committee charge. It says here, disband <coughs> the Lake Maspinock Weed Management. I I'd like to pull that uh, off of there to put disband. Uh, which we have to, at the board of select, we review a draft charge for a new standing mm -hmm. committee to advise the town management of weeds in Lake Maspinock. The Board of Selectmen will consider disbanding the Lake Maspinock Weed Management Advisory Committee, a temporary study committee which has completed its work. I'd like to just, I'd like to, to 
leave this at just let's let's review the uh, charge. Um, Thank you. At this point, I'm not going to disband a, a group until we hear from them and make sure that they have the input on this on this charge also. If, if I may. All right, so, uh, Mr. Kamala, can you walk us through this? Yes, um, through the chair, I just distributed uh, copies of the draft charge. Uh, this is the first time the board, in fact, uh, is reviewing this document. Um, our thinking is put forth the concept to the board, receive your comments and suggestions, and then we'll revise the document accordingly. And at that point, perhaps we can begin the wider stakeholder consultation process. Uh, in terms of specifics, um, it was interesting in the office, we were going back and forth uh, regarding the name of the uh, committee. Uh, we settled on Lake Mass Penobweed Management and Control Input Team. Uh, as discussed previously by the board, this is a standing committee. And thus, with that in mind, it may be helpful for the board to also provide us suggestions in terms of the initial terms of the five members. Uh, usually what happens is um, in the past we've considered staggered terms at the beginning of each committee, this term. And then um, we're proposing five full members based on input from the board. We uh, have identified the vicinity of Lake Maspenog the Conservation Commission, Park and Recreation Commission uh, as uh, entities that need to be identified um, requiring participation in the committee. Uh, we are also proposing two at-large members, uh, the reason being the whole issue of um, the lake as well as weed management uh, is widely um, viewed as a matter of interest in town and that's why we're suggesting two members at large. Specifically, we're looking at this committee as the advisory arm of the town, uh, specifically advising the director of public works mm -hmm. with regard to the implementation of the Lake Maspenok Aquatic Vegetation Control and Watershed Management Plan adopted by the board in 2016 with regard to the following fundamentals, prevention and detection Awareness, education, training, awareness, education, training, awareness, education, training. Very important. Uh, prevention and treatment, inventorying survey and mapping, uh, recommending an implementation scheme and schedule for an integrated weed management plan for noxious weeds on the lake. Uh, this is based specifically on the realization that the plan proposed uh, by the outgoing committee identified a menu of uh, management tools and we're saying that this committee will pull from that menu uh, and if need be, uh, if, they, if they make another finding based on fact, uh, could add to that menu. They will be reporting. I think it's important that there be regular reports not only to the board but also to the community. Um, added a couple things based on comments uh, that the town has gathered on this topic um, over the years. Number one, uh, preserving quality of life. I think that has come out loud and clear in prior discussions. And then finally, um, I, I'm reminded of the comments from uh, um, the former member of the Appropriations Committee um, who always reminded us of how much the town paid, paid for the dam. Uh, however, in this case, we're challenging the committee to find alternative funding sources for some of the items that uh, the uh, management and control of which would require. Uh, I've also learned from, uh, from, from, from John Westerling, your director of public works, uh, that at times there is need for manpower to actually get on the board and uh, survey the lake. So the, the committee is expected to uh, help in that regard. In terms of qualifications, uh, energy, commitment, availability, communication skills, and ability to bring people together, uh, especially a willingness to work with stakeholders who may have opposing views. Um, this committee, as we discussed previously, uh, will be subject to the open meeting laws. And I'll take any questions from the board at this point. Um, Mr. Sorry, do you want to start, please? Sure. 
Um, so I guess the first thing, the first thing I'm noticing in this, well, first let's I guess start with my thoughts on term. Yeah. Um, I think in the end, uh, the most we want to appoint anybody on any of these committees for is a three-year term. Uh, so if we did, you know, one person at one year, two people at two, two people at three to start, that's good. We probably have to have some discussion on how we want to spread that out among these people. And then also part of that discussion, I guess, is uh, if the Conservation Commission and Park or Parks and Recreation Commission uh, put up a designee, can they bring that person down before the end of their term? Um, so those are, I guess, just things for us to consider. Um, when I look at those members, the first one is the one that strikes me. Um, one resident of the area in the vicinity of Lake Maspinock who has a background in weed management and control. Um, I'm thinking that unless that background includes somebody who's just a fanatic about their garden, uh, we may have one person that is eligible in the pool. <laughs> and I don't know who that is, but you know. You know, it's, it's a very specific background from a very confined area, you know, depending on how we, how we uh, define the area, too. Um, I think it's, I think that uh, it's definitely the right, the right, uh, you know, thought, and I, and I understand what we're trying to achieve, uh, but I just think that it really kind of narrows us down a lot. Um, on the point of the designees of Conservation Commission and Parks and Rec, uh, I'm assuming that when we say designees, they don't have to be members, yeah. correct? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the two at large members, I'm assuming that we want to have them be Hopkinton residents uh, because the lake does span into other towns as well. If I may, through the chair, um, mm -hmm. let, let me address Mr. Stestari's comments beginning with the last comment. Okay. Uh, I think that's an interesting point of discussion because in the past we have received uh, some comments that perhaps we should include include uh, neighborhoods from the surrounding towns of Milford and Upton. Um, and then in terms of the uh, designates from the other commissions, yes, you're correct. Uh, Conscom, Park and Rec can designate somebody um, outside the committees themselves. And then on the issue regarding background in weed management and control. I can tell you that over the years, having worked on this issue, there are many experts I'm on sure this topic from, <laughs> 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 yeah, from, 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 from the lake area. Um, and also, oh, honestly, on a, on a more serious note, um, there are several entities um, that are associated with the lake, either in terms of residency or being members of the association, who, he, who really have been working on, on, on weight management and control mm -hmm. issues for, 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 um, for a while. A and I'm sure there will be people coming forth uh, with this relevant experience. And also we, we were trying to, by, by incorporating this phrase, we were also trying to tap into the fact that uh, there may be members from the outgoing committee who may use their experience being members of that committee uh, to qualify okay. under this guide. Okay, so yeah. yeah, so when I say, when I read uh, the, that the person has a background in weed management and control, the thing that comes to my mind immediately is a professional background. Yeah. Um, so if we're going to interpret it loosely like that, then certainly there are going to be other people who are qualified. Uh, we can apply the same question to that one, though. You know, is it a Hopkinton resident or is it someone in the vicinity of Maspinac from any town? Uh, and I think that those are just items for uh, for the board to discuss. Yeah. Ms. Wright, I see you have a little writing there. <laughs> some of it is just questions to myself, and I've had some of it answered. But um, no, I agree with Mrs. Hastari. The first thing that jumped out at me was that first qualification. Um, I, I see in your preceding paragraph you said um, all members shall be Hopkinton residents. So that seems to answer the mm. question of, of you know whether you live in town or not. You see, I'm not reading this. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that that first uh, that first qualification about a resident in the vicinity. I would, um, I would recommend that the weed management person not be required to be a resident of the vicinity. They might be, but I think it would be wise to 
broaden the pool of other town residents. We might find someone from another part of town that has excellent background. Maybe they aren't even so emotionally connected and might be able to provide a different perspective. I just, um, I don't think we need to hem ourselves in by requiring it only be a resident. But I do feel that it's important that there be a good representation of the neighborhood on the committee. So I would recommend that the number one just be um, a member with a background in weed management. And then instead of two at-large members, you have one member who is a resident of the area and then one at-large member. And that would, A, not limit your pool of applicants for the weed management background, and two, make sure that there is still representation um, by the neighborhood. That, that would be my um, suggestion. Um, I, my reading of this is that all these activities, prevention, awareness, treatment, inventory, uh, it looks like these are all to be done by the DPW director, but the board is to consult and advise, recommend and coordinate with him for doing these activities. So the, the committee is not doing these activities, they're advising the DPW director who does these activities, is that right? Correct, as well as I think there's reference to providing support, um, and I'm thinking specifically on the inventory aspect. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but it, this would all, these activities are all under his direction with, with their input, okay. Um, so by and large, the decision-making actions are done, the team advises, the director implements, and in general, the decisions are between the team and the DPW director, unless there is some larger issue that comes back to the Board of Selectmen, or does the Board of Selectmen have any decision making in the activities at all between the board and the DPW? Yeah, the, the framework that we're working from is that by the end of the day, the Board of Selectmen is the chief executive board of the town. Right. On any policy issues, the director has to come through the town manager to the selectmen. But th this, these general activities can go on between that board and the DPW director without regular involvement of this board. This board only gets involved if there are significant policy, policy issues, issues that can't be addressed between those two. Correct. Okay, yeah. that's kind of what I thought. I'm just, yeah. just double checking. And my last question is, um, there isn't a mention of herbicides in here. I guess those are sort of implied in all this. Um, that was always a hot topic. Are we saying that that final step is also going to be generally between this committee and the DPW director, or is that a point where this board or the or the community as a whole gets involved? Where, where do you see the herbicide issue, if, if needed, falling into this structure? I believe the application of herbicides is a policy issue. Mm -hmm. um, I believe, that. yes, I believe that the discussion at, at town meeting was very instructive mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how we should approach mm -hmm. that issue. Uh, and in my conversation with the, with the director of public works, I, I have made that clear that if there is going to be any application of herbicides, that that issue will need to be discussed through the selectmen in a public meeting okay. with input from the public. Okay. Um, yeah. Should that be stated in here? so people understand. It seems yeah. that it could be alluded to in here, and the public could read that, that this allows for, in the dark of night, a decision between these boards be made sort of surreptitiously, and oh, one day we wake up and they put her besides in the lake. Um, there was tremendous concern about that. Um, I'm seeing both sides. You know, at some point there needs to be a decision-making body. On the other hand, it was very clear that the community was concerned. Um, I, I, I would kind of like to maybe make address that here so people read this policy and understand that the community, if we get to that point, will not be left out. We don't intend to do that. 
I, I thought that we addressed that back in December when they came in front of us and, and they said that, you know, when, that, when the board came to us and they said that they were going to, uh, that, that it's almost, a, it's an absolute last resort and even at then it was only going to be small spots in case they absolutely need it. I thought they, they, they remember they had a slide about that mm -hmm. and there was, there was an absolute uh, last resort. Well, I, yeah, I don't disagree with you, Mr. Chairman. I guess what I'm saying is this is going to be the stated Mm -hmm. kind of policy. Um, I mean, right now we're discussing, oh, was it said, was it not? I thought they said. I mean, if that's a topic that is of concern to the community, I see mm -hmm. an advantage to putting it in black and white so the community can read this and be assured, not have to, ah, do we talk about it back then? Was it, in, you know? Um, I just think it should be made clear that uh, there's going to be, there's going to be a, a um, a procedure that's not going to leave the community out if we go that last step. This isn't just going to all get slid through. Right, um, Mr. Kamal, is, is there a way that we can or we can put some of that in there without uh, tying the hands of the the committee and the DPW? Um, Again, I think as I said at the beginning of the discussion, the purpose of tonight's uh, conversation is to solicit input from the board. I think the point is well taken. We will look into uh, um, the avenues for integrating that comment into the charge. Yeah, it, might, it might just be a simple statement of pretty yeah. much what you just said, that yeah. um, you know, sh should the committee and the DPW director feel that uh, the, the problem is, is, has risen to the level of, recommend, of herbicides being recommended, um, this will be uh, handled through the public hearing process and uh, meeting of the Board of Selectmen. Just something <coughs> that people know there's going to be a step before it just happens. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Chairman. So, mm -hmm. Oh, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll finish this one up and switch you right over. No, no, you stay right there. Um, okay, cheers. <laughs> <laughs> no. Thank you. Um, so, when I read through it, the only questions that I had were, as Mr. Sadari said, uh, the designee, as long as the, it's, it's a, I just wanted to clarify that it was designee of the CONCOM and Parks and Rec, it didn't have to be a, a sitting member of those um, commissions. So uh, that was really the only question that I had as I looked into it. Um, and then obviously the, uh, the herbicides is a pretty hot topic, so uh, I like to kind of make sure that it's it's uh, it's well documented that you know it needs to be well vetted to see who's going to be able to be the last person to decide that uh, the herbicides go in or don't go in so that's all that i had i, I won't spring this one on you mr Her. I'll, I'll i'll just jump in right now the uh, uh, uh mr uh, uh, mr Camaro, is there um any provision for the dpw director to maybe get any extra peer review before he does anything, you know, when it comes to you know, when it comes to our policies, or can we have uh, have it uh, have something peer reviewed just to make sure that uh, that he's he's happy with it, or can we give him the ability to go out and get something checked up on beforehand? Yes, uh, and in fact, it's a it's a two step process. Uh, so far, the the committee, as well as the DPW director, have been assisted by a consultant who is a specialist in this field. Okay. Uh, and if there are any issues that require further evaluation, I, I believe uh, he is placed to make that judgment. Okay. Yeah. Do you have any uh, comments, Mr. Hurd, now that you're, you've got settled in? Uh, not at this time. So this is specific to um, the new the, charge. The new charge. Yeah. Everybody's good? Yeah, we had a few, a few little updates um, <clears throat> on the uh, timing, uh, and the uh, uh, and then the makeup, uh, you know, the vicinity for for somebody who has some, who has the uh, background in weed management and control, and then the two at large members, one uh, maybe one being from the vicinity and one being from anywhere else in town. And how many total? Uh, five member five. board. <clears throat> I like it. Efficient. Yeah. Oh, good. Thanks. Excellent. So, uh, uh, Mr. Kamalo, is there a uh, motion that we have to make on this, or, or is this just a uh, informational? Yeah, at, at this point, I think this is the preliminary conversation with the board. We'll incorporate the board's comments into the um, 
into a revised document, share that with the wider stakeholders, and then come back to the board for final discussion. And now I am going to turn this meeting back over to the chair when it comes to. Uh, oh, well, actually, I'll, let me just introduce this. We do introduce this one. It's uh, the uh, ne ne next item on the agenda is the naming of the uh, <coughs> new Department of Public Works facility. Why don't we just go ahead and go back and just yeah. do the reorganization? Let's do that now, right? Okay. We're all here and. Um, I think that's one of the most important things to do following the election is to let the community know how we're going to move forward. So uh, I'll just sit here uh, and do this por portion, if that's okay with everybody. Uh, I'm sorry I'm late. I was at a, uh, a client meeting in Marblehead, Massachusetts, which is just an awesome town. Not quite as awesome as Hopkinton, but a very nice town. And leaving there at 5.30 is like <laughs> sticking toothpicks in your eyes for three hours trying to get to the oh. Metro West. Anyway, so my apologies. Uh, with that, every year after uh, an election, and I want to congratulate all the candidates that ran, those that won and those that lost. Uh, thank you for participating in the democratic process here in Hopkinton. Uh, but following the election each year, um, we uh, take a look at whether we want to reorganize the board or not. Uh, tradition would have it that we generally do. And I certainly support uh, getting some new folks involved in leadership positions on the board. Um, so that's what we're going to do right now is go to the agenda item where it says reorganization of the Board of Selectmen. So with that, uh, the chair, me at the moment, uh, will entertain a motion to appoint someone new to the chair going forward. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion. Mr. Sestari. Uh, I would like to nominate Mr. John Catino to be the chairman of the Board of Selectmen. I will second that motion. We have a motion from Mr. Sestari and a second from Mrs. Wright for Mr. Catino to be the chair going forward. Any other nominations? Hearing none, how do you vote? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? It's unanimous and so carries. Mr. Catino is now the chairman of the Board of Selectmen. I'm going to sit back in my nice, comfortable chair over here. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Herb. Okay, I thank you very much for your confidence, everyone. I really appreciate it. Thank you to the citizens of Hopkinton for electing me for another three-year term. I, I'm humbled and I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. With that, uh, the chair will entertain um, a motion for a uh, vice chairman. I'd like to make a motion. Absolutely. I would m move to name Ms. Claire Wright as the vice chair for the Board of Selectmen. We have a second. I'll second that. Excellent. Any, f any further uh, nominations? Hearing none, how do you vote? Aye. 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 It's, it's uh, unanimous. Congratulations, Thank you. Madam Vice Chairman. <laughs> how would you like to be addressed as Madam Vice Chairman? <laughs> that works. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, with that, thank you, everyone. All right, uh, do we, uh, we're changing chairs at all? Is with, with this? Uh, Everybody comfortable yeah. with the city? For now. Okay, Switch great. It up next week. Okay, fabulous. All right, so um, the next agenda item is um, the, uh, this was brought up by Mr. Ted Stone, naming of the new Department of Public Works facility. The Board of Selectmen believes that the naming of public assets is a matter of substantial or significant public interest that deserves care careful consideration. In 2014, the Board created a policy to establish a systematic, consistent, and transparent approach for the naming of public assets in town, which involve a public hearing. So uh, it was brought up earlier that uh, Mr. Ted Stone, you wanted to discuss the naming of the DPW, DPW, the new DPW facility, Mr. Westerling, at 83 Wood Street. Mr. Ted Stone, would you take us home? I would. Um, so it's nice to go around town and to be able to see some of the places in town that have been named after prominent people uh, from Hopkinton, you know, the, the Aubrey Doyle gym and the Dick Bliss gym and uh, Coach Hughes Field and, and things like that. So uh, in keeping with the tradition and uh, naming things after, after influential people in, uh, in Hopkinton, I would like to move that we name the new DPW garage the uh, Thomas McIntyre uh, garage. Uh, and that is for, um, for many reasons. Tommy had um, 
you know, he grew up in town. His dad was the superintendent of the water department. Uh, his brother worked there for a long time. His other brother uh, has a lot to do with it. And Tommy has always been a guy, if they needed a loader, if they needed sand, if they needed salt hauled, uh, dump trucks, anything, he was always, he would just do it. And, um, <clears throat> and I know that uh, in his recent passing, uh, I know that this would, uh, although he probably would kind of snub his nose at it because he doesn't want the acclaim or the accolades, I guess, um, this is a very appropriate, uh, very appropriate um, cause for me to bring his name up. A lot of people after he had passed had thought that maybe we could name uh, you know, one of the schools after him. And if you knew Tommy, uh, naming a school after him is not, uh, <laughs> was not as appropriate as, as naming a DPW. Uh, you know, the guy lived and died in his sandbox and uh, it's, uh, he really had a true, a true love for all things, trucks, DPW, highway, uh, everything there, and uh, from just everything in town, this is, uh, I, I've, from what I've thought, and I've actually discussed it with his family, and um, I will tell you that it, it was a kind of an emotional uh, event when I discussed it with the family before I presented this. Um, it's definitely the right thing to do in my eyes, and uh, the family's all for it, and um, I think it would be an absolutely wonderful asset to have his name permanently attached to the town for the rest of all of our lives for a long time to come. So that's my thought on that. Excellent. That's, that's, that's great. Um, and does anybody else have any thoughts on this? Sorry. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in support of this 100%, but uh, I do have a question for Mr. Kamalo, and that is uh, I know that uh, a few years ago the board passed a public asset naming policy, and I just want to make sure that um, we're following the policy and so that you know, this doesn't swing around, you know, do, you know no, no good deed goes unpunished, as they say. Uh, so I want to make sure that we've followed the policy. We're not, uh, you know, uh, circumventing anything to rush it. Um, again, I'm 100% I'm supporter, but I want to make sure we go through the right channels. Yes, through through the chair. With that said, I, I think therefore the message tonight is now that the topic has been brought to the board's attention, my recommendation is that um, staff work with Mr. Tedstone to compile an application um, which in fact is the requirement of the policy that will be formally presented to the Board of Selectmen. Okay. Okay. Does the okay. public hearing come with that as well? Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so we yeah. would start a process that would lead to a public hearing where we would codify and perhaps yeah. support it. Um, yeah, we got it right, yeah. Would, uh, would Mr. Tedstone uh, consider a slightly different name? If, I guess we can get to that when well, we like, get to yeah. the application like and everything. A, like a nickname or something? Not for you, <laughs> <laughs> for the facility. There's plenty of names out there. Yeah, well, I, I, I will. Uh, I'll definitely work with the family and with the board, and, and we'll come up with something appropriate to. How about the, suge the suggestion? Yeah, I like I like barn worked into it somehow, only because it's Hopkinton and it's that character yep. that you know created the town, town two hundred years ago. The right. McIntyre right. barn, right. Thomas McIntyre barn, mm -hmm. something like that's yeah. a little bit more great. fun, if you will, well, and a historic. Kind well, of. I think that's a, a a very good suggestion because forever it was called the town barn. Yeah. Like whenever it would start snowing, we would say, let's get, you know, we, we would rush down to get to the town barn to see if we'd get picked to plow. Hmm. Um, so it was always the town barn. So uh, I think- uh, Something along those lines. Yeah, yeah, I think that's good. I cool. think that's good. That's great, thank but you. If, I, I thought you were asking me to, I, I don't know what you were asking. So. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know either. <laughs> but, Excellent. So. Ms. Wright, I yeah. know you had a nickname for him that I didn't know. <laughs> I was worried about that too. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say uh, I think it's a great idea, and uh, I know Mr. Ted Stone has brought this up, and this is very near to him. Um, but it's not really just the, the Mr. Ted Stone show because when I saw this come up, that's the first thing that crossed my mind. Oh, we should name it after Tom McIntyre. I mean, I thought that too. You know, so anyway, I know there's a process, but I just I just want you to know that uh, 
I suspect I'm not the only person out there uh, who has made this immediate connection between the DPW barn and the trucks and the dirt and yeah. everything that Tommy loved. So, my two cents. Thank you. Excellent. Can there be Tommy's toys inside? Tommy's toys. <laughs> Tommy's toys. No, this is great. Hey, uh, th thanks, for, thanks for suggesting this uh, to, to get on the agenda. I think it's uh, it's great. So, uh, Mr. Kamala, let's please start that process. Um, so I, I guess yeah, we, we, we're starting it right here with a uh, with a suggestion, and um, let's uh, see if we can uh, get the uh, town hall working on uh, setting up a public hearing and, and having uh, Mr. Ted Stone fill out the right paperwork. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for bringing it. Okay, let's. Uh, Oh, there's a fun one every sewer year. Time. <laughs> Fiscal year 2018 water and sewer rates preliminary discussion. Excellent, Mr. Kamala, would you would you mind introducing our two guests <clears throat> or three guests? Yes. In, in fact, it's more than it's more than four. Two. It's four. Um, this is yes. This is a team effort. Um, in in terms of process, the the board of selectmen. Uh, annually set the water and sewer rates. This is per uh, state as well as uh, local bylaw. And uh, the practice that we have uh, established over the years is that first we begin with an informal discussion with the board. And that's why we're here tonight, uh, to have this preliminary conversation with the board. Uh, and then uh, a formal hearing uh, is now scheduled for June 6, 2017. Uh, at a time yet to be established. Introductions. Um, as I said, this is a team effort, uh, including uh, the town manager's office, uh, the finance office, uh, the water and sewer division from DPW, as well as our long-term consultant, uh, the Abrahams Group, ably presented today. On my left, Matt Abrahams, uh, um, he's here uh, to present the data to the town. Uh, he's accompanied by John Westerling, your Director of Public Works. Uh, Eric Cutty, welcome. It's, it's tough to get Eric to a meeting because he's always out working 24 hours. Uh, and, and Chris Sandini, he has jumped into this process, our new CFO, uh, and this is perhaps his second year now uh, <coughs> participating in this exercise. So, without further ado, Tim. All right, good evening. Good evening. Thank you for having us. So, uh, as Mr. Kamala mentioned, I'm Matt Abrahams, part of the Abrahams Group here to present to the board an update on the water and sewer rates for FY15, uh, as in years past. Did I say 15? 18, I'm sorry. FY18. Yeah. I don't know where 15 came from. FY18. Um, as in years past, we, we conducted a similar analysis this year, and so we're happy to report that the funds are in better shape than when we, when, than when we did this presentation last year. So we are going to walk through an update on water and sewer separately and present some options for the board to consider. Up on the screen, you'll see a presentation of the Water Enterprise Fund budget comparing this year, FY 2018, to last year, FY 2017. Uh, town meeting approved an, a water budget of about $2.2 .2 million for FY 18, and that included about $50,000 in retained earnings to balance the budget. And certified retained earnings, the last certification, which was at the end of FY 2016, has an amount of close to $1.4 million for water. On this screen, on this slide, we're showing projections for water. As part of our analysis, we look out over a five-year period. And what we do is we project revenues and expenditures in each of the five fiscal years that we analyze and compare the two. And also what we do is we take retained earnings, where they are today, where we think they'll be at the end of FY17, and then project it forward based on how each of the five fiscal years compare to each other. So this is what we're calling our baseline scenario, which is really the do nothing scenario. Um, this really shows what we think will happen if nothing changes, meaning if there are no rate changes over the five year period. And as you can see with water, uh, if we focus on the bottom two lines of the table, 
we can see that retained earnings is trending downward in each of the five fiscal years. This is similar to what we've presented in past years. And what we did want to include this year was some reasons why the water fund, the projections are looking a little bit better this year than when we did this analysis last year. And we've, in, and we've included some reasons here on this slide, one of them being that we focused on more specific, more detailed bill data when we were doing our user charges projections this year versus the multi-year average, more macro approach that we did last year and in years past. We, uh, we have a better understanding of new properties coming online, really the new developments in town and how that impacts revenues. Uh, we noticed that there were less expenses in FY17 than originally anticipated, a little bit less capital in the plan for this year's study, and a higher retains or earning, earnings balance in 16 than we anticipated last year. Retain earnings. What should the focus be? What should the target be of retain earnings? Best practice recommend 10 to 25% to of the operating budget as an operating reserve. And in addition, we recommend that the town have a capital reserve in place in case it needs to replace a large capital asset. So based on a $2.2 million budget, 10% would be $220,000 for the operating reserve, 25% would be $550,000. Capital item could cost $250,000, so we are recommending a minimum of about $470,000 or about 21% of the current operating budget. Options. We're presenting three options this evening. The first one is the do nothing baseline scenario where no rates would, where rates would not change. The top table is very similar to the table we looked at a few slides ago as to what retained earnings might look like over the five-year period if nothing were to change. And the bottom table just shows user impact, in this case not impact, but what those user types, what their current bills look like. Those are yearly numbers. Each user is billed twice per year. So that's combined of those two bills. Next slide, very similar slide, in that we have the retained earnings projections up top based on a 1% rate increase over the five-year period. So that would be in each of the five years. And the impact that, the, it, the projected impact on retained earnings for each of the five years, and also down below, what the impact could be for the same user groups. What their yearly bills would, would project to look like with 1% in each of those five years. Those are, I'm sorry, those are the average annual bills? These are. So if I look at average residential user, uh, usage 42, 47, and go across, that's the average? We calculated what the, what the average bill is for residential users. The average usage per bill yeah. for residential users, and then we calculated the bills based on that number. That's the average usage, huh? Wow. My kid's got to move out. <laughs> <laughs> through, through you, Mr. Chair, just to further clarify that point, if you look at the average residential user today, the annual bill is $244.12. To the right of that, if we went up 1% in the rate, their new bill on an annual basis would be two forty six fifty six, And then you continue to read that across through the years. So, excuse me, Matt. So that 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 truly is the average of all the uses in, in Hopkins right now is is forty two forty seven, or is that just a a? a no, that's that's the average they okay. calculated. Because it is okay. I just want to make sure that that's just not a constant that that it comes down from the state or feds that they just use. Okay. No, it's right. based on Hopkinton's data. Okay. Can I just ask what's tier two user? <clears throat> So uh, we wanted to find tier, the, the minimum tier, sorry, there are three tiers for water. There's a minimum tier, which I believe is one to 1,000 in usage. That's what the first line represents, someone who doesn't get out of that first tier with their usage. And then there's a second tier, which um, I believe the high point of the second tier is the 8,000. So we wanted to, to capture somebody who's at the high end of the second tier and doesn't go into the third tier.
So the next slide, option three, is very similar. We're just looking at a higher rate increase than we were on the prior slide of 2% over the five-year period, and the same analysis is presented for that scenario. And you can see when you look at the top table that retained earnings project, if we look out five years, into the ballpark of what we're looking at for recommended reserves. So that's the, those are the slides we have on water. Would you like to move on to sewer at this point or discuss water first? Yeah, let's, let's do one at a time. Okay. Mr. Herb. So, Matt, you started out saying that we we're in pretty good shape compared to years past. Um, so why would we need to raise it at all? If we look longer term, we want to make sure that the fund itself has healthy reserves in future years. So currently, reserves are healthy, they're strong, but based on what we're projecting over the five-year period, they don't look nearly as strong when we get out a few years. So increasing rates now help mitigate that issue down the road. Okay, thank you. This is story. So our five-year, our five-year outlook is based on, you know, I think it's in our presentation or our materials. It's right above these projections, I believe, and we're showing the capital expenditures year over year. Yes. Uh, right. Yeah. So where are these? I guess where are these capital expenditures coming from? Um, Three, Mr. Chairman, we have in the DPW, we have a five-year capital projection moving forward, which includes things like um, water main construction, design, and the actual installation. We have two sections that we are currently designing, uh, Cedar Street and Route 85 on the Hayden Row end. Uh, it comes from things like um, any system improvements beyond just those two, we have, an, we have an annual system improvement, but it also follows that capital plan from the uh, report that was done by Weston and Sampson two years ago that laid out the capital plan so that we can ensure that we provide adequate water supply and treatment for the community. So one thing I'm thinking here is we're, as we look at this five-year plan, uh, you know, I see in 2018 we have a um, yeah. million and a half dollars uh, for constructing the Fruit Street well blending. You know, that's something that we've discussed in the past. Uh, fiscal year 2019, we have supplemental construction funds for Cedar Street Water Main at close to $300,000. We have a million and a half for the Fruit Street well field improvements, which I'm not sure if we've discussed. It sounds, you know, fairly vague to me. Um, then we have $735,000 for Hayden Row water main replacement. We have a million dollars for additional pipeline improvements in Hopkinton. Uh, you know, and then, and then we go out to the next year and there's a $2.5 million project, construct high service, high service system. Um, when I look at this stuff and I see us starting to plan on this, it's almost I feel like it's almost an approval of this capital plan, which I really don't know the details of, uh, because we're trying to set the finances up for this. And the way this en ends up working is we get to town meeting and we start talking about this plan, that plan, this purchase, this new pickup, uh, you know, this new backhoe. And it's, you know, it's just, okay, well, that's part of the water and sewer uh, fund, you know, so it's not hitting the general tax ledger for everybody. And so the people in town meeting generally look at it and say, oh, yeah, okay, well, that's, that's part of water and sewer, so that's just going to be taken care of by water bills, not my taxes. Um, but I guess I just want to talk to the rest of my, the, my fellow board members here and saying that as we're looking at this, and to Mr. Herr's point, uh, you know, right now the, the finances look uh, pretty healthy. We're looking at increasing for the possibility well for keeping them healthy for the next five years but that projection is all based on this spending and this spending isn't something that we've really taken a detailed look at um, 
And, you know, I mean, it, it's something that we don't necessarily have the expertise to deal with in one meeting and just say, yeah, that's what we have to do. Um, so I guess I would recommend to my fellow board members that we start looking at this plan in a little bit more detail um, because, again, you know, it just seems to me that once this goes through, um, it's, I'm not going to say it's rubber stamped right through town meeting to get all this stuff done, but, uh, you know, it's something that it, it, people, people seem to pay less attention to when we get to the actual, uh, when we get to the actual question. Another question, comment that I have is related to, um, every summer we have a watering ban. Um, and you know the watering ban happens if people are caught using water when they're not supposed to then there are fines that go out and warnings and all of that type of thing I think I know the answer to this and it's not necessarily what I want to hear but I'm wondering maybe either rather than a watering ban or in combination with a watering ban uh, is it legal for us to have some type of uh, staggered rates so that you know during those peak seasons you know forget the hundred dollar fine you know if you use over you know X for you know cubic feet or you know or cubic meters of water then the rate is going from this much to this much uh, and that way you're you're penalizing the people who are using a lot of water and it's not relying on somebody driving around at you know, four o'clock in the morning to see where the wet driveway is. Um, I'm wondering if that's an option. Through the chair, we uh, the the watering ban is mandated as part of our Water Management Act withdrawal permit, as that's issued right by the bottom. DEP yeah. from May through September. So that's that's a, a necessary ban that we have to put in place. But we can certainly look at and provide the board for consideration a new tier above the, the existing tiers that we have. Uh, some would call it a seasonal tier. Some would call it a high water use tier. Uh, it would serve not only the purposes that you mentioned, but it would also help to, uh, to conserve water for folks. If they're, if they're paying as, they, as the more water they use, they're paying a higher rate, it will help that conservation effort. And as a matter of fact, uh, when we put in our, our, our permit application for the next 20 years of water withdrawal. That was one of the comments from one of the um, one of the watershed agencies was that our seasonal water use is above what is recommended or industry industry standards. Uh, so that's something that we need to work on. So I think that that that's something that we can certainly provide for the board to consider. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. So I guess. To, to uh, build off what Mr. Starry said, um, with the drought and and um, the fines, I don't know if that's within the four corners of, of what we're talking about here, but much in the lines of, of how I thought the kennels should go, I think that the fines should be substantial enough to really make people think twice about um, watering when they shouldn't water. Um, but, I don't know if we're able to set the rates or if we're not able to set the rates, but if we are able to set the rates, make it the first time would be a warning. The second time, you know, they know they're doing it wrong. So make it be substantial. And, and I think that that would, um, you know, and I don't know what the fines are right now, but um, I know that if you made it substantial, it would be, a, a, I think, a very successful deterrent uh, for people to water their lawns when they shouldn't. And I think that that would be a, a, an incredible way to, for us to save um, water. And if they didn't adhere to it, then the money we pr bring in, we could buy the water from Ashland with the, the, with the uh, water that they're using with those fines. So, um, you know, I'm a firm believer of giving someone a break once. And then <coughs> if they snub their nose to it, then um, you know, and make it so so it's something that hurts them, so they'll think twice about it. Through the chair, do you have any recommended levels of? I don't fines? know. Can you tell me what the present fines are? Uh, it's actually a town by law. The first offense is the warning. Yeah. The second is a hundred. Each subsequent offense is a hundred for the possible liability of uh, water termination. Okay. So 
Okay. So I guess I would say first one be the warning, the second one be $250, the one after that be $500, and then where it says possible termination of water supply, mandatory termination of water supply. And I know that you're going to, that people are going to say they have kids and you know how do you have a house on in Cranberry Cove with a seven million dollar house with a with kids and you shut their water off? Well, they've been warned many times, so it's it's they're creating their own their own hardship. So, um, but then again, I think we uh, that's why I think we have to go through and change the bylaw for that's that. That's fine. So that's, well, a, that's, a, that's a bigger process. All right. Well, let's this one. get it going. You're the chair. Get it rolling. <laughs> we'll take a look at it. We'll, well, yeah, let's take a look at that yeah. and see if we can. Mr. Kamala, can you see if we can? Uh, uh, look at that bylaw and see if there's what the process is of changing that at this point. Yes, in fact, as a matter of fact, this question was asked before. By me. Yes, and we did speak with the town council. The town has the ability to adjust the, the fines. Does that have to yes. go to town meeting or anything like your normal bylaws to be voted on? If it's if if that's how it was created, it does. It is always advisable to follow the same route. However, if there's another enabling legislation that allows the town to do something else different, then it would be a policy decision by the board as to which avenue to take. Uh, no, that's it. Ms. Wright. Um, I don't really have any questions as much as um, comments. What I've, what I've gleaned from reading this report is that um, some of the better financial picture than what was presented to us last year has to do with additional revenues in many areas of town. Um, there have been revenues that have come in because of the new development. And these are revenues that we're really glad to have, but there's nothing that, it's not anything that's gonna keep happening. So, you know, we can be grateful for it, but it's their one-time things going forward. You know, it, it, it won't be there. Um, so, you know, we, we do need to look at our long-range planning without that additional infusion of cash that we've had because of some, some of the new developments. Um, and, you know, it just seems to me that um, I know we're concerned about inspect, in expenses and, and keeping costs low for our residents, but water is a critical infrastructure. The old phrase, you never miss the water till the well runs dry. I mean, we want fields, we want nice roads, we want all these things, but man, if you don't have the water resources, um, everything else is, is secondary. So, you know, I think in terms of um, responsible governance and providing long range critical infrastructure for the town, you, you can't overstate the importance of, of water. Um, and from what's been laid out by the Abrams Group, and you look at what is happening over time to our retained revenues, even with this additional influx of cash that came in through our development and a few other accounting issues, um, you know, that, that decrease is, is just not a healthy thing. And the different two options that have been provided, I think option number two with the 1% rate increase resulted in for the average user over five years, a difference of $12. And option number uh, three that was a 2% a increase resulted over five years of an increase of $24 total, which um, in the cost of daily living is not a lot of money for getting something very important for us. So, um, you know, though you, your your report here says desired reserve should be between 10 and 25 percent of the operating budget, um, and you know, right now we're down five years out to 7.5 percent, which is just I, I take your financial advice that that's not considered a healthy situation for the town. So, you know, I. I appreciate this report and I would support the town taking the necessary steps to assure that we have <coughs> a good up-to-date water supply and um, are in solid financial footing with respect to our water funds. Through the, through the chair, 
Yes. Um, what action did we take last year? Oh, that's how I was going to start. I thought it was two percent too. Yeah. Okay. So that's why I'm going to start talking. Two percent. Two percent right here. Okay. Do you have a follow-on? Do you have a follow-on? Uh, after you have your yeah, comments, okay, great. I, I yeah, uh, okay, yeah, because we raised it last year. We actually, we just got the bill, I think, this week, for this uh, last week, because um, my wife just opened it up and said, uh, you know, are you guys going to raise the rates again? And so here we are. We're just, you know, we're, uh, and so I just want to make sure that, that we're not going to be every year saying, okay, we need 2% year after year so that we can keep doing it, because now if we do 2%, it's compounded over the 2% we did last year, so now we're actually up to 4% raising. In, in, in just uh, you know 25 uh, in a, a 13 month period, um, you know, and so I just want to make sure that that we're not going to continue to do that. And then it, and then to Mr. Sestari's point, you know, this is based on on this spending that's going out, uh, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Uh, you know, the, the high service system for 2.4 million, another million dollars for the additional pipeline. The Hidden Road Water Management, and then what about the water tower? Is this is that in this, or is that uh, outside of this? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that's in here. That would be the additional long-term debt. The million okay. and a half dollars was already approved last year. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, as an update, we did open bids and through the competitive okay. bid process. That was it. Uh, those those prices came in below the 1.5 million, which is about 1.3 million dollars. And what's the schedule on that? If I saw, I'm taking us a little bit out of the. Uh, but people, right. people were asking that yesterday when we, I happened to be standing in that area. And yeah. Mr. Chairman, at 845 they have to be either the design review board uh, or shortly thereafter. Um, but we're going to go through the design <coughs> review board. We've already got the ZBA approval. We've got to go to the planning board next Monday. And then once school has released and everyone's out of there, we're going to uh, mobilize and start to take down that existing tower. And uh, according to the manufacturers, the supplier, it's a Two month window between tear down and completion of all the testing and disinfection. So we look forward to that being online sometime in September. Nice. Nice. Now, uh, a, a, a couple more. Um, will, this, will the blending system you know, help our inventory or so, so we can actually sell? Because to, to, to Ms. Wright's point, there was a you know, I know some of this revenue is coming in for, for new water meters uh, being it's being installed, um, or the hookups. I'm sorry, and um, but but then again, we do get uh, a, you know a constant flow of, of revenue because we're selling them water. Um, so I was just wondering if um, if the new blending system is going to help us be able to sell more water as, as a product. Mr. Chairman, that will allow us to maximize what water we can pull out of the wells on Prue Street, wells one, two, and three, and six. Uh, well number two, we've got the elevated levels of manganese. So this will allow Eric Carty to be able to maximize what we're pulling out of the ground there. And the more that we can pull out of our own resources, the less we have to depend on other supplies, in this case, we would actually. Okay. And uh, the one that, uh, that I hit you with every year, this is the best part about you know, continuing to stay on this board, is that uh, I can follow up this is the uh, the changing of the water meters. Mm -hmm. Are we catching up, or, or because you know I remember what you said? Oh, we're doing 10 percent per year, but then we grew 10 percent uh, or several percent, and so we we started falling behind. Are we going to at some point uh, start replacing more of the water heat more water meters so that uh, we reduce our lost water and don't get continue to get pinged by the state? Mr. Chairman, if I can touch on unaccounted for water in a broad sense. Um, Unaccounted for water is non-revenue water, and we are currently uh, down from four years ago, we were at 29%. We're down to between 16 and 18%. We are not satisfied with that, so we continue to look for where that unaccounted for water uh, is, is coming from. And we do that through several means. Um, we do an annual leak detection of our system, and when we, when we find leaks, we repair them immediately. We did a level one water audit two years ago, which identified uh, where those unaccounted for water sources are. 
We just received a grant from DEP to do the next level, level two water audit. We're following the American Water Works Association. And what that looks at is in more depth in areas that we can invest in finding or reducing that unaccounted for water. So that is ongoing. Um, the newly installed meters that we're installing are no longer the mechanical ones like the old ones that, that we've had out there. They are a magnetic system, so they read much more efficiently. They read the low volumes much better and much more accurately. And also their accuracy lasts, instead of 10 to 15 years, mm -hmm. it's out to 20 years. So the new meters that we're installing, uh, in where we're installing new meters, primarily two different areas. The first area is new construction. When we look at Legacy Farms South, Legacy Farms North, there's nearly a thousand meters there. Um, this past year, we did somewhere around 300 meters in just new construction, and we replaced somewhere around 200 meters for any of those existing, pre existing meters. So, yes, the system is growing, and that's that 300 meters. Um, and whenever we go out, whenever we find that, that there's a question of meter accuracy or a meter stopped, or if people think that they have leaks, any opportunity we have when we find in the home those older meters, we replace them right away with those new meters that are the, the magnetic read. Um, we are reviewing our procedures with DEP when we're looking at our leak detection uh, systems. And uh, I, I have good news, the, those meters that we've re replaced with the new meters, uh, we put them through our, our bench testing and we found that the majority of them, 90% of them, we're reading nearly accurate. So even though we are replacing the old meters, we have a good sense that those old meters that were replaced were reading accurately before they stopped. So we, we continue to work on that. We are not satisfied. Uh, part of, part of our, our, our biggest challenge is working to find those, those non-revenue water sources. But is, is there any way that you can put in place a, uh, a better program for the meter replacement, because I I think it's one of those that that actually could pay for itself, rather than you know, because the 300 that are going in, that's still less than 10 percent, you know, and when you know, and I know you have the new construction, but we we've, we've really got to start catching up on the, some of those water meters. I, I agree, and that's that's something that we need to do a better job of, and we work every day to try and improve that system. So if you could uh, actually try and do something with getting those done, it would help. Mr. Kamalo, what do you got? Do you have anything to? Uh... Just one point. Um, I think, Mr. Sistari, your, your point is well taken in terms of the board's familiarity with the long term capital plan. Um, you will recall three years ago when Wesson and Samsung presented the, the plan, um, we went through it in. in in, in much more detail. What therefore I take from your comment is that it's, it's incumbent upon us uh, to revisit that subject regularly with the board. Uh, and one way to do that is, uh, um, in fact two ways to do that is, one, we may need John to do an interim report to the board in terms of, this is where we were three years ago, these are the programs that we put forth these are the capital projects that we've moved forward, and this is what remains in the flowing years. And if there are any adjustments that need to be made relative to how the projects already implemented are impacting the long-term view, then that we have that discussion. The second option uh, that we have is, uh, we have been talking at staff level uh, in terms of putting together a business plan uh, for the two enterprises. That in itself will allow the board to delve in much more detail on the capital projects, as well as other expenses that are related to, to the two enterprises. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think that um, with respect to the capital plan, maybe going through some of these higher dollar value projects, but going through them, you know, one at a time, maybe two, uh, but going through them, you know, the whole plan put together doesn't really give us the opportunity to, uh, you know, delve into it, as you say, and, and get into the detail to understand, uh, you know, the particulars of it. Okay. So. Mr. Thank Chair, you. are we ready for a motion on water projections? 
through the chair. This is a preliminary discussion. Oh. The votes will be taken uh, on June 6th. Because I was going to make a motion, which I won't. <laughs> yeah. No, no, we still, I think. Uh, keep it at zero, because we got three years of plenty of cash. And then maybe next year, look at it again. You know, whatever we do this year, we've got, you know, we can always project five years out, but three years from now, we still have a million dollars. And that's so, working through projects, too, that are on this list, so. So, uh, so we're. a great rush to raise. So, uh, well, when, when's the, uh, this, so this is the preliminary discussion, when's the, uh, when's our final discussion? June 6th. June 6th will be a public hearing. Okay. We've advertised it. We hope the public will attend, and the board will then and take action at that meeting. And a decision needs to be made by what day? By the end of June. Okay. Okay. Excellent. So, is there anything else we have to do with, uh, with the preliminary discussion? Well, we still have to touch on sewer. 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 Oh, you're right. Okay, yes. thank you. Sorry. At 30,000 feet, as the old chair used to say, right? <laughs> okay, Mark. Four okay, chair. Four let's chair. discuss sewer. Old chair. Chair merits. So the slides for sewer are very similar to the slides for water. We'll go through them one at a time. Uh, on this slide, we see the FY18 budget for sewer compared to the FY17 budget. The FY18 sewer budget uh, included to about $267,000 in retained earnings, which is down from a number that was much higher than that in the prior year. And certified retained earnings at the end of 2016 was about $1.2 million for sewer. And the projections, this is the baseline scenario, very similar to water. And you see going out five year, uh, the five-year analysis again, but this one for sewer, uh, where retained earnings similarly to water are trending downward over the five-year period in each of the five years. And like we did with water, we also wanted to make a few comments about why the projections in general are more positive in, uh, in our analysis this year than they were last year. And we note a few things, the decrease in expenses from the budget that we used uh, last year to, uh, compared to the budget we used this year and we project future years based on that budget, so it does have a pretty big impact. Uh, less indirect costs carried in FY18 compared to what was carried last year. Um, there additional revenue with privilege fees that project to be collected in FY18 that was not included last year. And again, retained earnings balance uh, the projection um, being a little under what it, uh, the reality is showing us this year. Similar slide on retained earnings and uh, the recommended best practices for operating reserve being 10% to 25%. In addition to that, a capital reserve uh, approximating the cost of a large capital asset in case it needed to be replaced and on, a, on an emergency basis. So based on the $2.9 million sewer operating budget, 10% is about 290,000, 25% is about 725,000. Capital, again, we're just saying about 250,000 for that. But if you combine the two, we're recommending a minimum of about 540000 or about 18% of the operating budget. So here is the option one, which is the do nothing or the baseline scenario. Again, that table for retained earnings projections is similar to the one we, shown, we just showed on a few slides earlier. And here is what current bills look like on a yearly basis for similar user groups uh, to what we showed last time for water. Option one, 1% with the same retained earnings projections on the top table and also the user impact with projected new bills if the 1% were to happen in each of the five fiscal years that we looked at. Average residential for next for 2018 would be up about six dollars for yearly impact, and about six dollars each year going forward for the average residential user. And last slide that we have for you tonight is option three, same setup, two percent rate increase, uh, reserves projecting to be extremely healthy in the outlying years, with two percent over each of the five years. And again, the yearly user impact. Mr. Hurd. 
I think it's very strong and healthy. I appreciate uh, the time put in to, to lay it out for us, but we'll wait for the public hearing, but I don't see a need to really act in 2018. We've got plenty of cash for on hand for a couple of years now. And in 2019, if it starts to look a little different, we can tr address it then, but why take money when we don't need it? Sort of like the underride. If we don't need it, don't take it. Sorry. I concur. That was an easy one. Ms. Wright. Well, I mean, I, the long-range projections concern me, but those who've done this a few more years than I have uh, seem to be comfortable with taking a wait and see, so I, I respect that, but I also respect what the professionals are saying about making sure long-range that we, we provide for uh, what the town might need in, in reserves and in retained earnings. So, um, you know, I, I respect what the professionals are saying, and I'm certainly willing to willing to wait if those that know more than I do uh, are comfortable right now. Did or Mrs. Wright? Okay. Now, now with the uh, water, there was that uh, whole list of capital improvements and capital items. Now, does this include? Such, uh, you know, those those six and seven digit uh, items that, that I, I didn't I didn't see it in my packet here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, there are uh, fewer items on the capital list. We are just completing the capacity analysis of our sewer system, which is looking at capacity, treatment, and capital needs. And what that is telling us is that our capital needs from the sewer do not include holistic upgrades or improvements to the system. The system is at the system has adequate capacity to service the areas that we currently service with sewer. The only time that we would have to improve the system by upgrading the size of pipes would be if we wanted to service other areas of town. So we don't have those capital needs, the million dollar capital needs. Uh, the capital needs here are much more modest and they include um, updating the CWMP, which is only $175,000. So that, that's more of a planning tool and uh, a couple of vehicles. So sewer capital needs are much more modest than the water. Though if I may, Mr. Chair, with the understanding that number one, the town has had a long range plan um, with regard to the Fort Street wastewater treatment facility. It was designed for, um, for a capacity that is higher than where we are now. Um, and then number two, we also have a long-term relationship with Milford um, that has a sunset clause. Um, so we need to take that into account. And then thirdly, most recently, there have been strong requests in the town manager's office to expand the sewer service district, especially around Lamba Street, um, and, and also with an idea of accommodating much more intense commercial uses on Elm Street. As John said, we are in the process of completing the uh, infrastructure evaluation uh, exercise and that might change the numbers that you are looking at in terms of future capital projects. Okay, so will that be ready for the uh, for our June sixth review? I don't believe so. No. Yeah. In case those, in case some of those questions come up, that's what I was just. Is th they they may come up for the public to uh, um, increase our reach. Mr. Chair, yes. uh, I'd just like to make a comment. Um, you know, specific to the concerns of. Our colleagues uh, who are who are looking at the longer range and uh, concerned about the possibility of the board uh, basically taking no action or no increase. Uh, when we start looking at some of these charts and we look at uh, water, for example, and on the retained earnings balance as a percentage of the budget, if we don't raise anything, uh, then you know next year the retained earnings as a percentage of the budget is 65 percent then it's 52 and as we go out to the five years it's true that when we get out to 2022 we're at a negative 1.5 percent uh, 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 
balance as percentage of the budget. But we're not we're not saying let's keep it at zero percent increase for the next five years. We're making a decision for the next year. Right. And so, in my opinion, um, you know, unless we unless we have other data that really shows some uh, dramatic surge that's going to happen in the next two years, when I see that. Uh, the recommendation is between 10 and 25 percent of of your uh, uh, retained earnings balance as a percentage of the budget, and we're at 65 percent, and then we're considering raising it even more, and then the next year we're still at 52 and a half percent without raising it, and we're still considering raising it. Well, now we're getting into a situation where maybe we're taking money out of people's pockets when we don't quite have to, and if we were going to look at this realistically. We would start looking at the next five years and some proposals of, okay, we can stay at zero for the first two years and then consider raising it one percent and one percent, and see where we start landing. And if we're landing between the ten to twenty-five percent, I think that this proposal is is um, uh, you know it's it's fairly simplistic in nature, and it's just saying, you know, this is if we don't do anything for five years, or this is if we do one percent for five years. It's not really showing us any any combination of efforts here. And I think that that's what we need to consider. Good insight. Good. Good. Anybody have anything else? Mr. Kamalo, anything else? Um, again, I want to thank the, the team effort um, that went into preparing for this presentation. Um, and uh, Eric, you have, to, you have to forgive me for this. We never get the opportunity to see Eric at these meetings and <laughs> just want to commend you. Yeah, and just want to commend him for, for his great him, work that he I see him on TV as a weather watcher more than I see him here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right. yes. Excellent. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for coming thank in. You thank you. All. Thank you. Look forward Thanks. to see you. So, on, uh, so Eric, you're coming back on June 6th still? Yes. To take questions. Yes. Oh, good. 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 Say it only yeah. twice. Yeah, we can see it. Excellent. Yes. Thank you all. Okay, moving on to the next item, which I, I've written all over my uh, agenda. Um, board liaison reports and board invites. Mr. Kamalo, do we have any board invites coming up? Um, I don't recall. Any. Oh, yes, big one this Thursday. It's the marathon committee's celebration of the 2017 Boston Marathon. Post party. Yes. And they're going to have great weather for it. Yeah. Is, is that going to be back at Labor's again? Yes. Yes. Excellent. That's always fun. Yeah. That's always a fun one to go to. Okay. Is that the only one? Okay. Liaison reports. Does anybody have any liaison reports? Yeah. The, Mr. Chair. Yeah, sorry. There's another um, sorry. invite. Oh, it's not coming up. The grand opening uh, of the new Framingham intermodal parking lot in Framingham. And unfortunately, my, got my stuff is frozen. <laughs> it's <laughs> on uh, Friday, June 30th at 2 p.m. at the Framingham Commuter Rail Station. Thank you, Mr. Hur. Okay, now we'll go ahead and hit liaison reports. Mr. Hur. Um, the, uh, the school committee's subcommittee specific to the fields uh, is continuing their work. Uh, we have another meeting tomorrow. We've had a couple of meetings uh, since uh, the school committee last came uh, to, to visit with us. And um, there's been a lot of discussion about a possible um, uh, arrangement with CPC, using CPA funds uh, in lieu of standard tax dollars, if you will. Uh, so that dialogue continues and that work goes on. I just want to keep everybody up to speed as to what they're thinking. Thanks. Excellent. Mr. Starry. Uh, I have no liaison reports. Um, there was uh, one other, I'm not sure if this gets included in the standard invites, but there's uh, one of the uh, meetings of the five towns boards of selectmen that's coming up. I know Ms. Wright responded that she's planning to attend. Um, I think I'm going to try to attend. Uh, okay. I, yeah. I went, I went to the last one. That was interesting. I know you've been to another. Yeah, I've been to one earlier. Yeah, actually, uh, to uh, Brendan and I years. went to one. Uh, we went to the first one they had uh, back in the fall, I believe. Yeah, this in the fall. Oh, excellent. That's uh, but if, if other people are planning on going, we just need to make sure we coordinate so that we don't have 
an unintentional meeting. And through the chair, and to that end, uh, if board members have, this is the last call. If, any, if board members have any suggestions for agenda items for that meeting, please let me know. Ms. Wright? Um, I don't have any liaison reports, but I have two invite or in announcements I wanted to mention. Maybe I was still in your thunder, Mr. Sestari, but of course, Memorial Day, your famous, your favorite. That's my favorite. Holiday, uh, yeah. our wonderful activities that will start at, I think. Uh, but he's Mr. Patino. Yeah, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> it happens, it happens right. to us a lot. Yeah. Yeah. But, but he's new. And, and he's I new. did want to take the chance yeah. just to announce to people at home there's going to be an add on um, to that program, a continuation of a program the Cemetery Commission did last year in the afternoon of volunteers cleaning the stones of many of the veterans graves that have gotten darkened and dirty and illegible and last year we had a great group of volunteers that came to Evergreen and we cleaned over 65 veterans monuments and made them legible again. There was one up at Mount Auburn, a soldier that uh, passed at Andersonville prison during the Civil War and I uh, couldn't even read this thing when you cleaned it up and, and there it was. It was just so touching on Memorial Day. So we will be doing that again at Mount Auburn, uh, starting at two. Uh, if you want to do a Memorial Day activity that really lasts for a long time, bring a plastic bristle brush and a bucket and some elbow grease, and it'll make you feel really good. Thank you for everything you do for the Cemetery Commission, too. And congratulations on being reelected to the Cemetery <laughs> Commission. <laughs> no, no, it, it, you do that. You do that every year. That and, and, and giving the, the the tours of the cemetery. That's that's much appreciated. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Tetzel. Well, to build on what Ms. Wright said, um, I've spoken to Mike Whalen. Well, I haven't spoken an email with Mike Whalen, and uh, there's going to be a parade for uh, um, for that on Mer um, Memorial Day. And the American Legion people will be out there um, Friday, the Friday before Memorial Day, putting flags on the veterans' uh, stones starting at 4. So if, uh, if there's anyone out there that wants to come out to the cemeteries um, and, uh, and help put flags out, uh, that's another uh, worthwhile and meaningful activity. And uh, I think that would be fun. Yeah, I, I don't really, I wasn't able to, uh, no liaison reports, I was pretty busy last week, and coming into this week, um, but uh, Memorial Day is my favorite one, and, I'm, and it's, it's abs absolutely, ev everybody that can possibly come to the Memorial Day remembrance uh, that we have uh, at each of the cemeteries, laying the wreaths, um, doing the Gettysburg Address, and, the, the, and then the... Uh, I guess that if, when it's a remembrance, I don't like to really call it a parade, but I guess it is. It's a march mm -hmm. um, between the cemetery, from the cemetery all the way up to um, Town Common, and then we have a, another ceremony at the Town Common. It truly is Hopkinton at its best. You know, people think of Hopkinton as the uh, as the marathon, but the true Hopkinton is that day. We could be, you know, any t any town in rural America at that mm -hmm. point, and it's just wonderful to see the families out. It's just absolutely my favorite day in Hopkinton. So I really encourage everybody to come. You'll have a great time. Even last year when it rained, we were at St. John's and it still was a heck of a lot of fun. So with that, um, Mr. Town Manager, your report, please. Y yes, um, I'm, I'm distributing uh, to the board hard copies of the conceptual plan for Behind employee retention, and with, with the with the chair's permission, may I invite uh, uh, Chief Slemen? Uh, I have found him to be a very stimulating intellectual partner uh, in discussing some of these issues. Hmm. Oh, very yeah. nice. <laughs> it's an interesting observation. Yeah. Chief, you can. Yeah. Um, I want to break this down into perhaps three, com four components. Um, number one, explain why an employee retention plan. Uh, number two, walk you through some of the assumptions that are behind the, the concept that I'm putting forth. Uh, and then four, speak specifically to the four plan. I call it the four point 
concept plan. Um, and then the, finally, I just talk to you about some of the observations um, regarding items that I could not include into or incorporate into this plan. Um, in terms of why an employee retention plan, I think we all know about the demographic um, where we have looming retirements and at the same time are struggling to attract young talent. Um, there are also negative conceptions in general regarding government. Are we allowed to say young talent? Are we, are we allowed to try to, to uh, promote, I mean, uh, to pull by age? It's not relative, not, not in terms of age, but in terms of people who want to move into public service. Okay. Yes. Um, there are also um, negative perceptions regarding um, public service, uh, including um, low entry level pay, cumbersome hiring processes, uh, and also uh, the perception that we can't account for the expectations of the millennials. Uh, uh, improved economy, uh, we see that happening where we are now competing. Uh, our employees want to move to the next level. They are moving either to the private sector or they are moving to the next rung of, of towns, the larger towns than us that pay more. Uh, there's also what we have said, and, and, and Brian, this is intended to really get you going here. Uh, our continued uh, um, 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 sequestration era where we're being asked to do more with less and in much quicker time. Uh, and we have also, we've also been thinking about how to actually leverage the investment that the town has put into the HR department. Um, several years ago, we, it, was a, it was run by the personnel committee, became a one-person office, two-person office, now it's a two-and-a-half-person office. And so my challenge to them is they now need to help us develop a total employee experience plan uh, where most of their time is spent in making sure that employees have a great time working for the town of Hopkinton. Our idea here is the merrier the employees are, the better the quality of services are, uh, based on the fact that they'll now be producing more and be happy doing their work. Uh, and then finally, I'm a big fan of public service from the viewpoint of we are in the business of building community and part of that feel good story is that the town has to continue to find ways to enrich what I refer to as the employee experience, uh, leading to more purposeful and productive uh, or meaningful work performed by the employees. In terms of assumptions, um, my, my, I, I offer the following. The focus must be holistic. Let's, let's talk about the holistic experience of the employees, considering satisfaction, engagement, wellness, and alignment, alignment to the town's vision. Uh, the conceptual plan elements apply to uh, the wide range of employees that we have, part-time, full-time, and so forth. However, I'm quick to concede that um, there is a difference when you are looking at work that is mechanical versus work that is cognitive. Um, I also believe that uh, pursuing a retention plan has to do with what we identify as the employee's needs so that they can perform at their optimum. Um, that's the assumption. That's why we do that. We, we retain people so that they can perform at their best. Um, the conceptual plan also accepts that for the most part, work is no longer a physical destination. Uh, I, I hear that from the wide range of employees here in town. Uh, it's no longer, I work when I'm a town hall. Uh, people have, Brian, I'm lifting this. Uh, they have devices and they can perform most of their work remotely uh, from, or from other locations. As you can see, we're doing town hall work from different locations here in town. Um, also, and, 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 and this point, in fact, has been emphasized through our leadership ac academy uh, with the input from the personnel committee members who have come in to conduct some of the trainings, that money is a motivator only so far. Uh, if you do not pay employees enough, employees will not be motivated. If you pay employees enough, that takes the issue of money away from the table, and they're less concerned about the money and can then focus on the other things we mentioned, wellness, engagement, and so forth. 
Uh, for the most part, the benefits of developing existing staff outweigh the cost of finding new employees. We hear that uh, from town residents. We hear that from uh, during some of our board members' uh, uh, discussions. Um, and um, we have Chief Slayman here. He's a good illustration of that. He was developed internally. Um, we also believe that um, one of the assumptions is that uh, we improve and add value to service delivery by adding something uh, of value to the employees. Um, and then finally, uh, and, and I think we, we have to emphasize this uh, whenever we have the opportunity, uh, that employees are resources of the organizations rather than they are not the, the resources of the manager or the, or the board that they work with. And that's the spirit that we're trying to build a town hall uh, where uh, with that spirit, we can then talk about collaboration, we can talk about cross-training, we can talk about uh, people being able to support each other as a team. Um, moving on, um, any questions so far in terms of the assumptions? Okay, um, as I said, this is a four-point plan. Number one, transcendent purpose. Uh, I think this is an issue that we have been grappling with uh, and we have had some success so far. The town has an established vision and mission statement. I'm working with individual departments now to develop their own strategic plans for their own departments. Uh, soon, we hope that after we complete that process, we'll then circle back to the selectmen and then ask the selectmen to develop an overarching strategic plan for the town. Uh, we have also been working on what we call the Caring Community Initiative. I uh, started working internally with the senior leadership and I'm now reaching out to different civic organizations in town that I will be working with to advance that concept. Um, here's what we need to do. Um, to get this going, we need to communicate a, com a, a, a compelling and shared vision um, by offering a strategic direction for the town. In other words, let's find a way to share stories that explain why public service matters. One thing that comes to mind is, if you look at town hall, it's difficult to come up with that story. But I'm glad we have the fire department. They save lives. We can build compelling shared stories around that theme. Uh, and also, through that process, we need to uh, let the employees feel that the town and public service stands for something greater uh, of more value than their um, individualism, uh, something that is bigger than themselves and that the town represents a brand that employees can leave, um, forge and maintain powerful connections between personal and town values, I think will be part of that process. Uh, we need to allow employees to live the town's vision and mission statement. That goes beyond simply stating the words. Let's find opportunities to allow employees to, to leave that statement. Um, this will require managers to uh, place more trust on the subordinates. Uh, it will allow us to, in fact, uh, one, one reason why I like this idea is it allows us to come together as a community. We say we're in the business of communities. We are also fortunate that we have, we have different uh, boards and committees in town that work on different issues. Thus, by creating opportunities for us to come together, different boards, different departments, we then can celebrate our very reason for being here, building community. Um, the only threat is that the one town, one vision, one solution concept is really difficult to to push for in a political environment uh, for obvious reasons. And then number two, we need to create a positive work environment. Uh, that's what I call the organizational brand proposition, uh, seeking and maximizing opportunities, processes, and tasks that allow employees to derive meaning from their routine work. Uh, and this is what we've been trying to push out at a uh, um, uh, town hall. For example, in explaining the success of the last town meeting, the focus is not just on the higher level staff. We have been uh, thanking and acknowledging the work done by our facilities department. That's the department that allows meetings to happen. So in other words, we're giving people the opportunity to see how they, their individual work contributes to the overall mission. Uh, building a flexible, collaborative, and humanistic environment. You know what that means? 
it means we get rid of some of the stupid rules uh, and processes that have been in place for, for a long time. And we challenge employees to, to identify those opportunities. Uh, support processes that foster broader perspectives, collaboration, coaching, and career mobility. I will address that as the fourth part of the, of the plan. Interesting bullet, respecting the community and public service moral authority in crafting the employee's experience. Here's what that means. We are here to serve community Hockington. We as staff may have expertise, we may have a stronger knowledge base, but by the end of the day, all of that doesn't mean anything if we're not serving and respecting this community's moral authority. Um, supporting open, honest, and coherent communication. In other words, no spin, whether it's from the, it's the boards, the committees, it's the managers, uh, it's the employees, it's communicating to the public, let's have no spin. Um, and also creating an environment of respect, trust, and giving before getting. Uh, in other words, the, the last phrase, um, giving before getting, means we as an organization have to identify things that we are absolutely going to make available to employees without necessarily saying, well, give us this first before you get this benefit. Um, promoting constructive non-conformity by allowing employees to feel comfortable. Uh, this bullet really points to how we allow individuals to be themselves, to balance their social life with work demands, uh, and also allowing people to uh, express different opinions without fearing that there will be reprisals. Um, we need to train managers to want to hear bad news, uh, <laughs> provide many channels of communication, and foster dissent. Uh, dissent. Um, at the same time, expressing appreciation and celebrating employee and community achievements on demand. Uh, I think we have fallen into the trap of doing uh, celebrations on specific uh, events, calendar events like the Christmas period, uh, Thanksgiving. We need to find other opportunities to do um, the, the, the celebrations on demand when things happen. Um, any questions? Okay, uh, meaningful work. Uh, this relates to growing my sense that I can make a difference by working for the town of Hopkinton. Um, again, it ties back to what do we do to uh, strengthen the idea of we are in this together. We love public service. We are here to advance a common cause. Uh, and specifically matching that with what the employees really want to do to support the town's vision and mission. Um, this requires us to understand it and better define how empl employees feel about their jobs, what they mean to them, uh, and what sense they make from, from their jobs. And one way of getting to that point is what we've been doing over the last, uh, I believe, six months. We've asked employees to really take a strong look at their job descriptions, uh, provide input on how to write, write them. Uh, we have even made suggestions that employees can uh, name their jobs the give nicknames to their jobs um, to better describe what they, what they feel about the work that they do for the town. Um, and also developing a system for polling employees more regularly and more often. Um, and this relates to finding a way to measure, track, and monitor stress. We work hard, we work hard, we work hard. We also want to make sure that we don't um, burn out the employees. Uh, we also want to use the, the polling processes to um, uh, seek employees' ideas, uh, allow them to share their experiences, and also to rate the services uh, that they feel are most important based on the input that they, they receive from the residents. Um, we also want to allow employees to take control about how they work. Um, I always I share with the supervisors that's, that it's important that we give clear direction in terms of what work needs to be done, but le let the employees decide how they get us there. Um, also, finally, we also have to enhance the challenge um, um, mastery opportunities. I, I think, I, I, it's, it, on this point, I really think back to 
uh, a sporting an analogy, there's a reason why athletes train every day, because they want to achieve mastery. Uh, we need to give our employees opportunities to do that. Um, in terms of threats, again, we need to be mindful of the workload distribution, uh, and also making sure that uh, recognition uh, is, is tied to the specific effort that, that the employees put into the assignment. And then finally, boost my strengths. That's the growth opportunity, make good employees even better. Should I say make good employees even great? Um, allow employees who are not perf uh, performers to fail, fail again and fail better. I think we've all read that book. Uh, identify growth paths for employees. Uh, hold managers accountable for training and supporting uh, uh, their employees whenever they're moved into new roles, uh, for bringing people together, uh, for investing in bringing employees together for cross-functional and interdepartmental or interdisciplinary programs. Uh, providing feedback on performance continuously rather than on a yearly basis. I think um, the HR department has done a good job in introducing uh, timed performance evaluations. Uh, and, and again, I, I go back to one of the assumptions I, I shared. It needs to be said that our performance review process, our merit-based review process was introduced as a way of bringing in accountability most importantly, allowing people to set stretch goals because as we were reorganizing departments, we were asking people to find new ways of adding value to their work. And, and we felt that the performance review process uh, allowed us to monitor, track, and evaluate how well we were doing in that regard. Uh, and most importantly, we were also, uh, this is three years back, we were also trying to find a way to justify and solidify the reasons for adjusting the pay classification plan. Um, and, 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 and finally, as, as part of this process, uh, I, I think the, the town needs to keep employees informed about its strategic decisions and what new talents are required. Because quite frankly, our jobs change regularly. Mm -hmm. um, we saw the amount of new legislation that was brought in at the last annual town meeting. The list was pretty long. We need to make sure that staff is trained to handle those new mm -hmm. bylaws uh, effectively and better serve the community. Uh, in terms of what this document doesn't address, I, I, I struggled on this issue. Technology. There's no way we can talk about employee retention without incorporating technology. But I struggle in terms of saying where exactly do we push technology. Uh, we can use uh, social media to better engage employees. We can use uh, technology to uh, improve productivity. Um, but I really struggle in terms of, of, of how to integrate that into uh, this document. And I'm going to continue my conversations with the personnel committee as well as the human resources department to see whether there are opportunities for us to do that. Uh, I think the other continuing issue is really finding ways uh, to build a team when in fact, in some cases, there's emphasis on boards that are elected independently versus other boards. Uh, however, we're finding ways a town meeting to a town hall to bring people together uh, regardless of which board they work for. So in a nutshell, that's the four-point plan built on the assumptions that I laid out and attempting to achieve the goals that I uh, uh, apply it as the rationale for embarking on such a plan. Oh, let's make it up. Ms. Wright, do you have anything to... Uh, no, that was quite a... <coughs> oh, wait a minute. Do we, do, should, do we get... Chief. Chief, feel free to jump All right. in. Yeah. All right, so I'll, I'll take a little risk here. Um, one of my goals this year was uh, in employee engagement, working with the employees, employee development. Mm -hmm. And um, <coughs> I hadn't seen this before today and I gotta give Norman a lot of credit because um, I do talk with him a lot about employee development issues I run into and um, many of the bullets here of what I've gone through in the last five years is schooling from like um, Metro West Leadership Academy, um, we did some work with the Collins Center with um, um, leadership and management styles um, and the training mirrors most of the bullets that are on this report. 
And I have to say, it fits my style. I believe in it. And um, you know, some people can look at this and start to shake their head a little bit. But I truly believe that if you commit to something, just some of the basic principles that I have, you know, I, I have on my board like responsibility, trust, community, and you, you can just plug these words in and Norman's bullets of purpose and um, my eyes to read here, sorry, uh, work environment and uh, meaningful. I just kind of translate those words together in the same meaning. So I, I think you nailed it here. I think this is kind of you look at your individual organization and you make this as a commitment to build trust and to evolve forward with your employees to get to a different spot. I really believe in that. I think it kind of gets missing um, between private and public sector work. Um, and I, I just give you a lot of credit for putting something like this forward. So that's my take on it. Thanks, Chief. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I love the management style that you've, that you've brought to the, the department. It's, it's really it's taking root and it's really showing. Thank you very much. Thanks. He's right. Oh, I just think it's excellent. It's a lot of work and a lot of thought went into this, and I'm going to have to reread it and digest it. But um, I, I think this is a, an excellent template. Um, certainly very aspirational and um, on the right track to create a good work environment and hopefully retain, uh, attract and retain uh, good employees by developing a sense of satisfaction and challenge and commitment. Um, in their in their work environment. So thank you, Mr. Kamalo. Quite quite an excellent piece of work. This is very sounded extremely comprehensive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if it was only four points though. <laughs> <laughs> The personal committee will tell you when I first met with them, I said it's an eight point plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, like I say, it sounds comprehensive. And looking forward to the next step. Yeah. Mr. I think it's great, really well done, and obviously a lot of thought went into it. And I'm sure you collaborated with a lot of different people to pull it together. Just a couple of thoughts in no particular order, and perhaps in the weeds a little bit. Uh, I, think it, I think we should consider uh, titling it employee recruitment and retention, because recruitment is what it's going to be all about for the next decade, if not two, uh, so just to have it in the title. I love when I see uh, the walkers of town hall literally walking downtown at some point during the day in groups of two, three, and four. I think it's great that they do that. I think we should encourage that, and you know, if that means it's an extra 15 minutes for lunch, so be it. I mean, I, I, just, I really love to see them out having some fun, getting some exercise, and when they go back to work, their hearts go on a little bit faster and they're gonna get more done. I mean, it's just, it's good for everybody. So I'd encourage us to somehow encourage that. And I would actually consider, and I don't know if we can do it or not, is, and maybe we do, I should know this, do we pay for a wellness program today? In, in, in fact- um, Like a gym membership or a yoga class or whatever? Yes, uh, we, we negotiated into our health insurance plan um, the ability for employees to sign up for a program and then be reimbursed. We also uh, were successful securing a grant uh, through Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, to support uh, different wellness activities in town, including Weight Watchers, the walking clubs, Fitbits, and so forth. Great. Let's make sure yeah. they know that and, and use that because it just falls on that walkers thing. Mm -hmm. um, do we do electronic surveys of the employees? Have we ever done an electronic survey? There's a Survey Monkeys one site that you can go out to. We use it at work, and you can ask 20 questions every quarter, and they can be the same questions or different questions, and you can measure all kinds of different trends and how your employees are thinking and feeling about their work. Yes, we we started an employee engagement uh, survey, um, uh, and 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 followed it up with meetings with the individual departments. I, I know we went through police. Um, town hall, uh, and we still have to do. I think f did we? Yeah, we didn't do fire. We have to do DPW and fire. Yeah, B but that's that's one aspect that I, I think is very fascinating. Uh, it's it ties back with what I call um, organizational design, where you take th information from those surveys to help inform the direction of. The relationship between management and the employees. People like yeah. the idea of sharing, you know, yeah. confidentially their mm -hmm. thoughts about what's going on. So yeah. it's good to get that out of them. Mm -hmm. um, 
to get information for us, but also to allow them to download in a formal way. And then finally, the last thought is, you know, in terms of recruitment uh, and speaking about, you know, thinking about millennials and the workforce and everything today, how it's evolving. Uh, referral fees or finder's fees for good employees that are in the role for six months or longer. Uh, $500 is the market price, I think, for all of us to help each other recruit. We can't do it, but our colleagues in the town hall and the various departments could do it. We'd have to pay for it, obviously, but I think it's a positive thing to do. It shows that we're all in it together, and if you can help us out, you'll get a check for $500 or something like that. So I'd encourage us to look at some kind of referral or finder's fee. Thank you. I think it's a great job. Well done. Uh, same thing. So when the, when the fire chief was talking about uh, his board in his office, uh, if anyone's been to the fire chief's office, he does have that board up there, and he does have the goals that, that he goes through, and very rarely can you stop into the fire station without finding the chief up there with an employee going over stuff like that. So uh, I know that he, that he does a, a very... Uh, that he's made a, a marked effort to, to really incorporate his, his firefighters into the day-to-day -day operations of the department. And I know that, that the, the morale is up for that. Um, <clears throat> so when it comes to employee retention, uh, and Mr. Kamala, this, this is very comprehensive. It was very well written. Um, I think it just, you can boil it down to, if you make the, the employees feel like they're wanted and needed, and make them so they really want to come to work, it changes the whole culture. Like you and I have had conversations uh, in the past about you know, certain departments and, and the morale and, and how to get it better and how it was back then. And, and um, when you make an employee feel wanted and needed, where you know, if they're home and they, they have they see the, the weather is potentially a, a round of golf, or geez, I really got to get in here because you know they, it's important for me to get this project done or this work that I'm doing on the roads or on the on the fire department or police or whatever town hall. Uh, it, 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 that in itself boosts morale quite a bit, and um, and then like we've spoken about the managers, the direct managers for, or directors or whomever. It's important for them, when good, positive feedback comes in, to deflect that to the employees when possible, and when negative uh, feedback comes in, to absorb it, you know, publicly, and then deal with the, you know, deal it with it down the road. So, so don't throw the employee under the bus um, in front of people if you have the ability to not do that, um, and and. It's, it goes a long way for the employees to, you know, when someone says, what a great job you did sweeping Grove Street, I say, well, that had nothing to do with me. That was my employees <coughs> that did that. Um, and I think you're also dealing, when you deal with the public sector, I think people understand when they go to work in the public sector that they're not going to be millionaires quick. You know, like, they understand that, that in, in exchange for you know, the, the risk and reward where, where, you know, you're not out there, um, you know, making tons of money, but if one thing goes wrong, then you're out the door. You have st stability, but you're in it for the greater good. Yeah. So I think that you're dealing with a whole different mindset here versus Wall Street. And um, it, that's a certain type of employee that, that is inherited and, and that we have. And if you can make them circle back, you know, when you make them feel wanted and needed, and they, they want to come in and actually make a, a difference, then, then that increases morale and into retention. There's a great phrase that you touched on it. Catch them, catch them doing something right. Yeah. Right? Yep. We as managers of, in the entire organization, in any organization, if we're catching people doing something right, you know, they feel good about that. So whatever it is, catch them doing something right. What do we always think about? Catch them doing something wrong, right? And what's that create? A negative connotation yep. sure. and a negative culture. So let's catch them doing something right. It's, it's widely, yep. you know, it's a phrase that can catch on pretty quickly, but we all should be doing that with each other. Yep. yep. And, and uh, you Yes, go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Kamal, the one thing I noticed on here, I think six or seven times we've got uh, the uh, vision, and mission, vision and mission statements for the town. Yeah. Now, many of the companies that I've worked at, um, 
you know, as, you, as soon as you walk in the door, there's the vision and mission of, of the company that's up on the, that's up on the wall. And that's something I think we talked about a couple of years ago when we came up with the, the visioning statement for, for the town. I really believe that we should put it up in several prominent locations so people understand that this is the, this is what the the residents of Hopkinton want us to be thinking about when we're making decisions on boards, on committees, um, and also for for the uh, for the employees of the town. I think we should try and and uh, disseminate the uh, the vision around because many people don't know it. Um, the other the other thing I want to do is uh, I, I I was I was at. Uh, uh, a few of the town halls today, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> and uh, actually, visit with the chief for a little while too. Uh, you know, I just want to—I just want to, you know, say to uh, to all, again to all the town hall employees. I, I mentioned it last night, is that uh, the customer service is still great. Um, it's uh, they're, they're they're doing a great job, and uh, they, they're keeping up. I, I went to get sworn in at the town clerks. And uh, to print something out, they were handing each other a, the, the cord to the printer and, and plugging it in. But bed having a great time doing it. You know, it's it, the, the morale is still up there. And you're doing a great job keeping everybody um, up and happy. And it's, it's funny. I think that that uh, um, a benefit to uh, to this office clustering upstairs is we're getting we're getting cross training happening. <laughs> Yeah. By accident, you know, it's the people, di different departments are working together, and I think that you know, if somebody might be out or sick or something like that, that, that we actually have some cross training going. Well, I went to pick up a building permit today, and so I, I just want to commend you on, on you know, first of all, setting it up so quickly, and uh, and for keeping morale up in, in, in some of these tight spots that we get going. Um, but that's uh, that's that's really all I've got uh, on this, and thank you very much. It's, it absolutely is. Uh, is uh, incredibly comprehensive and, and like uh, this is this is more like 200 points. But uh, <laughs> thank you, Ryan. And, and next time we have to put a little bit more time in the agenda if we're going to go over this again. Yeah. Uh, again, the the idea is um, at a high level um, define the framework uh, for retention plan, and then let the supervisors working with the HR department work out the nuts and bolts. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's 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 uh, consistent with the principles espoused in this document. There's a reason why we have an HR department. Mm -hmm. uh, they absolutely have to spend time now focused on improving the employee's experience from the time we call them for interviews up to the time they leave the organization. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving on. Any uh, future agenda items? Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, I'd like the board to discuss um, the possible implementation of some type of uh, tool that uh, basically gives residents as well as the, the boards an opportunity to take a look at um, the different areas of finance uh, for the town and budget, spending, and things like that, uh, possibly tools. There's, there's one in town. Um, it's the, the, the company is in town, ClearGov. There are others that are up there that are comparable to it, uh, but it allows people to see what's being spent and compare it to other communities that would be in the same uh, market basket and things like that um, so that uh, we can bring some more visibility to that type of thing. That is great. <clears throat> That's something that uh, it, uh, it became apparent to me when uh, we're looking at this, the school committee budgets and stuff, and then looking at the comparison of how well we're doing with uh, such a, uh, a much lower per student uh, rate. Um, uh, Mr. Hart? Nothing at this time, thank you. Is right? No, not right now. And Mr. Tetson. Okay, so we, get, uh, we have that one. Um, I thought I had one on mine. Well, we got that June sticks coming up, and that's yeah, okay. So the follow up. Oh, yeah, I'm good. Okay. Anything else from anybody? Good. Any any correspondence or anything that you wanted to bring up, Mr. Camaro? No, I'm all set. Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah. All right. With that, the chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Yeah, it's, a, it's unanimous. Thank you very much. Have a great night. Everybody.